It's the late 90s, and an Air Canada flight experiences severe malfunctions while traveling from London to Vancouver. The pilots are unable to do anything and the plane crashes into the woods of northern Alberta. The crash was devastating. Only 10 of the nearly 300 people on board are alive. And even though they survived the initial disaster, their battle for life has only just begun. It's late autumn in northern Canada, and there's no telling when help will arrive, if at all. If the survivors want to make it through the night, they need to find shelter, and fast. As they trudge through the freezing woods, the group finds a path that looks like it might lead them to civilization. After all, if there was a path in the woods, that meant they were probably in a national park. And if they were in a national park, there had to be a ranger station around somewhere where they could warm up and call for help. They didn't have many other options, so they followed the path which opened up to a clearing. But instead of finding a ranger station or campground, they found something none of them could have expected. It was a pond, but there was something off about it. As they got closer, they saw that this strange pond wasn't filled with water, but blood. The survivors were horrified. That couldn't really be blood, could it? It must have been a weird algae or chemical reaction. But one member of the group, a man named Thomas Dean, who had been on his way back to his hometown of Prince George, British Columbia, thought there was something strangely familiar about this. He remembered being a boy and going to visit family in Alberta, and hearing an urban legend from the older local kids. According to the stories, somewhere out in the wilderness, in the northern part of the province, there was a pond full of human blood. And what made it even worse was that some said the pond was a gateway to hell. The SCP Foundation was also aware of this legend, and had been trying to pinpoint the exact source of it for decades prior to the Air Canada crash. They would finally receive definite confirmation of the blood pond when Foundation personnel intercepted a radio transmission from a ranger station located within the Wood Buffalo National Park. It was the survivors of the crash who had managed to make it through the night, and they were about to be escorted out of the park by rangers. The Foundation mobilized quickly to cordon off the pond, as at the time they were unsure of what potentially harmful properties the pond might have had. They set up Watch Station Epsilon 38 and put staff on guard to deter travelers from the area. The pond was given the designation of SCP-354 and classed as Euclid. Foundation scientists made a number of interesting discoveries about SCP-354 when they collected samples for testing. First, the pond was not in fact full of blood, merely an inorganic liquid that closely resembles blood in color and consistency. Second, and even stranger than the red liquid, is that the pond doesn't seem to have any definite banks or a bottom. Instead, the liquid in the pond increases in density as the radius away from the center increases. The liquid congeals at the edges, becoming more solid and blending into the surrounding soil. It also becomes thicker as one descends deeper into the pool, and a bottom of the pond has not yet been reached, if it even exists. Initially, the Foundation found no signs of life within the blood pond, but that would all change at 2.03 p.m. on the day following the opening of Watch Station Epsilon 38. When the science team noticed an unusual level of activity on the pond's surface, security footage feed showed a shape rising out of the pond, followed by a deafening shriek. After that, the feed was cut and Foundation lost all communication with Watch Station Epsilon 38. Fearing the worst, a mobile task force was dispatched to the location. When they got there, all personnel at the Watch Station had been killed by what could only be described as a gigantic bat. The task force was able to neutralize the entity, and as soon as they could, the Foundation moved in to increase security around the SCP, creating Area 354 and installing a permanent security detail. After this point, the pond started to regularly spit out a variety of monstrous entities, almost as if it was reacting to the SCP Foundation's increased security measures. After SCP-354-1, the giant bat, came SCP-354-2. 354-2 was an echidna-like monster the size of a bear that was virtually bulletproof but unable to escape Area 354. The Foundation neutralized this anomaly with napalm. SCP-354-3 was a floating black sphere capable of firing deadly beams of concentrated energy. The area's head scientist was able to hit it with a sledgehammer, causing the sphere to malfunction and self-destruct before it was able to escape the area. The Foundation wasn't as lucky with SCP-354-4. This creature was a reptilian humanoid that stood roughly 15 feet tall 
and was unable to be put down with gunfire. This was the first creature from the pond to successfully escape containment, and was only able to be neutralized when the Foundation sent in Mobile Task Force Omega-7, also known as Pandora's Box. The data on pond incursions is partially corrupted, so a complete list of creatures is not available. But some of the other monsters that came out of the Blood Pond include a killer robot, a set of gigantic tentacles that drag several D-Class personnel into the pond, a pair of panther-like creatures, one made of ice and the other of magma, that ignored Foundation staff and instead fought each other, and one seemingly normal human man who was executed as soon as he emerged from the pond. Tests on his body revealed that he was, in fact, totally normal, and would have posed no threat. These anomalies came out of the pond at fairly regular intervals for several months, before the pond went silent for an unprecedented 22 months. The head scientist at the time noted, I suspect this means one of two things. Either the red pool has died or powered down, or whatever the correct term for it is, or is charging up for something big to come through. O5 believes the former is the most likely explanation, and has recalled 30% of our total personnel and cut 25% of our funding. While I can only hope that they are correct, if the latter situation is true, we're soon to face some terrible monstrosity and we won't have anywhere near the force necessary to deal with it. I worry for all of our safety. His words would prove eerily prophetic following the events of Exploratory Mission 354 Alpha. The Foundation's research and development team built a specialized craft to explore the pond. Because of the strange properties of the pond's density, the craft was essentially made to be both a submarine for parts of the pond where the contents were liquid, and a drill for when the liquid congealed into a semi-solid towards the bottom. The exploration team consisted of Agent Swanson, Agent Turquoise, Agent 86, Dr. J. MacArthur, Chris Simmons, Leroy Tucker, and a pilot named Martin. With the team assembled, the ship was sent down into the pond. Nothing eventful happened for the first two days of the mission, but at 4.30 a.m. on the third day, gravity suddenly reversed for the crew of the ship. This seemed to indicate that they were approaching the halfway point, though what would be on the other side, nobody could say. On the fourth day, the ship surfaced, proving definitely that the pond was in fact some sort of portal. The crew looked out of the portholes to see the darkness of night above them. While sensors outside the ship detected nothing harmful in the atmosphere around them, the crew were wary of exiting the craft. The other side of the pond was nothing like the world the crew knew. For one thing, the night lasted for 28 hours before dawn came, and when the sun finally rose, it was much larger and redder than the Earth's sun. Under the light of the strange red star, the crew could see that the pond on this side was massive compared to what they've come into, more like a large lake. Surrounding the lake was sand and rocks that were covered in a kind of moss that disappeared under sunlight and regrew during the night. The team left the ship and started to explore. During their time in this strange world, they found that the day lasted just a few hours shorter than the night, meaning that whatever planet they were on had a roughly 43-hour long rotation as opposed to our own planet's 24. The team found a number of anomalous elements on their expedition, including razor-sharp grass that can puncture skin and streams of liquid carbon dioxide. They heard some loud roars in the distance once or twice, but other than that, the planet was eerily silent, with seemingly no animal life and not even wind. When it rained, the soil remained dry, and based on that, the scientists theorized the plants in this world were more efficient at absorbing moisture. On the 25th day, the team ran into a huge metal wall that appeared to be artificially constructed. Luckily, Leroy Tucker, a quick-thinking researcher, was able to rig a blowtorch from camping supplies and melt a hole through the metal. On the other side, there was finally wind and odd black grass. That's the extent of what is known about the other side of the wall, because the expedition logs are heavily corrupted after that point. But we know that whatever was in there wasn't good, because the team never returned. Strangely, there's no record of any names mentioned in the ship's log, almost as if being killed on the other side completely erased them from history. No other expeditions into the pond were launched after that. On an undisclosed date, a year following the discovery of the Blood Pond and construction of Area 354, the site was completely evacuated, and power was cut to the area. Mobile Task Force Data 12 was dispatched to investigate the cause of the evacuation, but before contact could be established, the area's on-site nuclear warhead was detonated, completely destroying the site. MTF Theta-12 was then attacked by a convoy made up of D-Class and other low-ranking staff who had evacuated Area 354. 
it was apparent that there had been some kind of mutiny within the site, and that a dissolution of the chain of command had led to its evacuation and destruction. The convoy totally annihilated MTF Theta-12, and no further contact with the former personnel of Area 354 has been made since. Following the site's detonation, a new site was constructed called simply the Red Pool Containment Site. Unlike the previous facility, which focused on research and neutralization, the new site is entirely concerned with containment. The shift in directive came as a response to the pond's apparent reactive nature. Each creature that emerged from the pond seemed to be in retaliation to the Foundation's actions, and it was theorized by some that the mutiny at Area 354 was triggered by some kind of psychic attack from the pond itself. An interview in the SCP file on 354 reveals that there was one more disastrous attempt to control and understand the blood pond. According to an interview with a Foundation agent, the head doctor proposed a scheme to drain the blood pond using a system of pumps and hoses. All non-essential personnel were evacuated in case of emergency, leaving only the pump technicians, D-class personnel, and a few agents for security. However, as soon as the pump was scheduled to be turned on, everyone at the site experienced a mass dissociative episode. The agent described the feeling they all experienced as like being in a dream and suddenly realizing that you're asleep. He said, Everything stopped being real. It was like we had to escape right now. When asked what happened when the pump was turned on, he simply explained that it wouldn't let them. This interview confirmed the theory that the pond is not only capable of releasing monsters out into our world, but also that it's capable of powerful but much more subtle psychological attacks. This suggests a chilling possibility, that the pond isn't just blindly reacting to being attacked, but it's fully sentient, and the actions of the SCP Foundation have only served to annoy it. And worst, studies of the pond's banks have proved evidence that the area of congealed liquid around the perimeter of the pond has been steadily expanding. That's right, the pond is getting bigger. The last thing the Foundation agent stationed at the site said before being dragged out of the interview and sedated was, It gets bigger and stronger every day, and now we've made it angry. One of the primary aims of the SCP Foundation is to contain the anomalies that they discover. Secure, contain, protect is their mission statement after all. However, there are some forces so unknowable and malevolent that there is no way to truly contain them. SCP-4205 is one such force. Very little is known about SCP-4205, even compared to other SCPs, many of which are mysterious by their very nature. We do not know what it is, we do not know what it wants, and we do not have any meaningful way to stop it. The best that can be done to protect yourself from it is to implement the few known preventative measures available and pray that it doesn't set its sights on you. The little information that exists on SCP-4205 was recorded by Wade Dalitz, a former junior researcher at the Foundation. He wrote the initial report on SCP-4205 on a computer, Terminal 4. Though his work was highly valuable and provided many previously unknown insights about the nature of the SCP, sadly his knowledge could not save him. The official entry on SCP-4205 was his final act before his death on December 11th, 1992. Before we get deeper into that entry, and Wade's final day on Earth, it's important to understand what SCP-4205 is, or at least understand the little we know about what it is. 4205 is a Keter class SCP, meaning that it's incredibly difficult or complicated to contain. It also shows extreme hostility toward all life. It is described as an amber-colored pair of human-like eyes, with the ability to appear spontaneously in windows, mirrors, or any other glass or glass-like surface. One of the reasons so little is known about these eyes is that anyone who sees them dies within seconds. Much like the mythical basilisk, the gaze of SCP-4205 is deadly and inescapable. The eyes only seem to appear to people who are alone in a room and never in places where there's more than one person. But aside from that, there is no way to predict where the eyes will appear, since it is unknown if the eyes are part of a corporeal body or even present on this plane of reality. There is no way to contain them or stop them from killing. This brings us to that fateful day, December 11th, 1992, the day that the SCP Foundation would finally be given some tangible information on the mysterious Amber Eyes. 
at the cost of one of their researchers' lives. Wade Dallet, a young man fresh out of his university studies, was brought on board as a junior researcher by Dr. Mark Forsyth, a senior researcher. Dr. Forsyth recruited Wade after giving a guest lecture at his university and being impressed by Wade's keen observational skills, thirst for knowledge of the unexplained, and determination to understand that which seemed to defy explanation. After Wade graduated, he was recruited by Dr. Forsyth and given the position of junior researcher at the SCP Foundation, where he assisted Dr. Forsyth, now a site supervisor, in his research. After several months of working under Dr. Forsyth with minimal responsibilities, Wade was finally given the opportunity to write his first SCP report on SCP-4205. Following some initial documented appearances of 4205, Dr. Forsyth approved further research into the anomaly, with Wade appointed as the lead researcher on the subject. Mm -hmm. According to Wade's entry, he was responsible for the discovery of SCP-4205 when he spotted the anomaly in a window. The later reviews of security footage determined that he was not the first person to observe the eyes. He did claim to be the first to observe them and live to tell the tale. In his writing on the subject, Wade is puzzled by the fact that he survived his encounter with SCP-4205 and wonders what could have set him apart from the others that fell victim to its gaze. He found himself frustrated as he documented SCP-4205, his rough drafts of reports dissolving into angry rants about his own incompetence. Wayne had difficulty adjusting to his new responsibilities, especially with the added element of his assigned subject's mysterious and volatile nature. In between his reports on SCP-4205, its previous appearances, and its effects on its victims, he wrote letters to his father, desperate for reassurance that he was not messing everything up letters that would sadly go unsent. In his coverage of SCP-4205, Wade made note of a troubling reoccurring element in each victim's death. When medical professionals attempted to revive the victims, it was always noted that their brain activity stopped much more quickly than in cases of death by natural causes. When examined, all aspects of the body aside from the brain were completely unharmed. The brain, however, showed massive nerve damage in the amygdala, hippocampus, medial temporal lobe, and occipital lobe. The appearance of this brain trauma had been compared to the effects of electrical shock or a severe head injury. In addition to Wade, six other people on record encountered SCP-4205. Every encounter ended the same way, with sudden brain death and severe nerve damage immediately after viewing the eyes in a reflective surface. The first encounter occurred on January 5, 1990, when Deputy Liaison Gena viewed the eyes in a reflective glass one-way window. Security tape reveals that the eyes appeared in the window eight minutes before the Deputy Liaison spotted them. As soon as he did, he fell from his chair and immediately died. Though the specifics varied from case to case, the end result of every encounter was the same, with none surviving long enough to relate what they had experienced, every encounter except Wade's. As he continued his documentation of SCP-4205, Wade's mental state quickly began to deteriorate, the process of his mind coming apart, and his thoughts giving way to confusion, fear, and anger at his own survival is documented in his reports on the SCP. He agonized over the questions of why he was able to survive gazing into the eyes of SCP-4205 when so many others had not. The question consumed him until he was unable to eat, sleep, or do anything but obsess over the SCP he was tasked with researching. As he became more agitated, he began to write about the eyes appearing to him again. On one occurrence, he attempted to touch them and described the sensation like touching a balloon to your arm after it had been charged with static electricity. He continued to report seeing the eyes. The worst was when trying to sleep, during which he was overtaken by violent sleep paralysis and plagued with visions of the amber eyes. The only comfort Wade seemed to find was in memories of his loved ones. He wrote about his mother and his father, even as their memories grew foggier to him. He also mentioned a man by the name of Theodore Quayle, who he claimed was a researcher at the Foundation. Later fact-checking determined that this was not the case, and that Quayle must have been someone from Wade's past. He wrote about Quayle wistfully, mournfully, with words of love and loss, tormented by the sense that he was losing his grip on reality and everything he once held dear. As Wade descended deeper into a hell inside his own mind, he continued to mull over the questions of SCP-4205. Was there more to it than what was visible? Did it have a body? Why had he survived the encounter with it? 
and what did it want from him? He decided that those who had perished immediately were the lucky ones. They had escaped the torture that had overtaken his life. The eyes were everywhere now, watching him even as he attempted to unlock their secrets on a Foundation computer. He spoke to the eyes at one point, but refused to write down what they said to him. His last entry, his last thought, was a plea for Theodore Quayle's embrace. There is no more written about the research or about the eyes, only a simple, desperate need for a comfort that is long lost. Now is the part of our story where terror meets tragedy. Contrary to what Wade thought and what was recorded in his final computer entries, he did not survive his brief brush with SCP-4205. The truth is that he spotted the amber eyes in the glass above his terminal monitor while recording the entry and died seconds later. Though his death was swift, it felt agonizingly slow, as revealed by his descent into panic and paranoia recorded in his writings. The entries recorded as a result of the connection weighed in the computer, his physical contact with it at the moment of exposure to SCP-4205's anomalous effects, allowing the terminal to archive his final thoughts before he succumbed to the deadly nature of the eyes. The entries were never physically typed, but rather jumped from his dying mind into the mainframe. His entries, the echoes of a dying mind, offer a glimpse into the way that SCP-4205 kills its victims. In the seconds leading up to death, the amber eyes fast forward a person's mind, feeding on the electrical impulses that it gives off as it speeds through what seems to be days of fear and of a loosening grip on reality. The death may be swift, but the suffering is long. Wade left the Foundation with a digital fingerprint, an echo of the person he was at his core in addition to his experiences with SCP-4205 itself. Wade spent his final moments terrified for his life, dreaming of a father that he missed and a long-lost love from his college days. His sacrifice must not be forgotten, because no one ever survives an encounter with SCP-4205. His documented final moments are the only first-hand account in existence. Junior researcher Wade Dalitz gave us a gift in death. He allowed the SCP Foundation a glimpse into the true horror of the Amber Eyes and a reminder of what they are capable of stealing from us. So be careful of windows, mirrors, screens, and all reflective surfaces. When you look into them, you never know what you might see looking back. The year is 1941, and the world is gripped by the most violent and widespread war in history. Millions march to war as bloody battles are fought across the globe. Horrendous atrocities are carried out on groups of people, and parts of London are bombed to rubble on a weekly basis. Considering it's only been 20 years since the last world war, it must seem to the early residents of the early 20th century that the world is coming apart at the seams. And amongst the chaos, it'd be easy not to notice a secluded manor house in the English countryside disappearing without a trace for 11 days before suddenly returning to our reality. But thankfully, one organization makes it its sole duty to notice the unnoticeable and understand the impossible, the SCP Foundation. And within that anomalous manor house, Foundation agents and researchers were about to find horrors beyond even their darkest imaginations. This is the grim tale of SCP-1461, better known as the House of the Worm. When the manor house reappeared after its 11-day absence, the Foundation zeroed in, sending agents inside to investigate. It was a two-level dwelling complete with 12 bedrooms, four baths, three studies, a main foyer slash ballroom, a library, a kitchen, and a pantry basement. The Foundation observed that a number of these rooms had been fitted with rows of bunk beds, similar to a boarding house or barracks. Only later would they understand why. They found that the upper portion of the home exhibited no abnormal qualities whatsoever. But as the agents investigated further, they found an entrance to the truly anomalous portion of the manor, the extensive sublevel system. No previous records of the building kept by the local council indicated that there would be anything below the manor's basement, so either the mysterious previous occupants, who were nowhere to be found, had built this sublevel or had just appeared here on its own. 
Regardless of which was the case, agents and researchers knew that whatever had happened down here had everything to do with the manor's mysterious disappearance. They descended into the depths of what seemed like a man-made cave system, constructed primarily from a mix of concrete, iron, and brass. It was a behemoth of 20th century technology, intricate snaking systems of pipes, gears, and pumping pistons. It was like someone had built an entire factory down here. But for what? The agents began to spread out through the labyrinthian bowels of the manor, hoping to find some answers. But all they seemed to discover was more questions. This place hadn't been built with any form of comprehensible logic. It was full of dead ends. Stairways that ascended and descended to nowhere. Doors that would open to reveal just walls behind them, or not open at all. It was like a maze built by a maniac. It didn't help that it looked like the place was recently hit by an earthquake, with some passages caved in and mangled machinery strewn about. It seemed that no human workers had interfered with the impossibly complex and bizarre machinery in quite some time. A number of the materials used to construct said machinery, as well as the grey sandstone filling in the collapsed passageways, remain unidentified to this day. Already, the sublevel was proving to be a complex puzzle box with only an estimated 75% of its layout ultimately being mapped by Foundation researchers. However, they would soon realize that this place wasn't just confusing, it was deadly. The only method of self-maintenance detected by the exploring agents were pipes that would fire a thick black lubricant onto the surrounding machinery. One of the Foundation agents had the misfortune of getting covered in it while exploring a darkened passageway and 80% of his body was melted as a result. It appeared that the viscous black goo was incredibly corrosive to all organic matter. A number of the machines also emitted dangerously high quantities of gamma and X-ray radiation, making it difficult to explore many of the caverns without heavy hazmat protection. And worst of all, were the extremely hostile creatures living in the caves who would regularly attack Foundation personnel. These abominations came to be known as SCP-1461-1, vicious steampunk Frankenstein monsters, once human, but with large parts of their bodies replaced by crude mechanical implants, including metal teeth and claws. 1461-1s have displayed a taste for human flesh, and they have dragged multiple Foundation agents down into their lair to be converted into monsters like them. It's believed that SCP-1461 is capable of controlling these bees through the strategic use of sound from its brass-speaking pipes, leading them into areas where Foundation personnel are present to instigate conflict. Many of these pitiful creatures have had their throats replaced by phonographs, endlessly repeating the same nonsense phrases over and over again. I am what you have made me. I am choice, and I am tyranny. Forgive me. I am then and I am now, what gods they will be then. I am evil and I am flesh, I am the trap. I am beauty and I am chaos, children are selfish. I am the worm, I have broken God. Still in spite of the mazes, monsters and deadly chemicals, the agents persisted and managed to discover several important locations. The gel production chamber on sublevel 3 creates glass jars from the unidentified sandstone and fills them with a slime that looks to contain living eyes and teeth. The factory deliveries room is filled with a huge number of crates and boxes, which seem to shift and change in number between Foundation patrols. The speaking tube room on sublevel 11 contains a grand pulpit that acts as the connecting point for the complex array of speaking tubes running through the entire cave system. The body parts of a deceased female also appear to be wired into the machinery, like spare parts. And on sublevel 12, they found the so called Catalyst Room. Here, they discovered a huge, complicated, clockwork and steam powered machine that appeared to be broken and missing some parts. Most horrifying of all, though, is the raised platform in the center of the Catalyst Room, on top of which is a metal hospital bed. A desiccated male corpse rests upon the bed, its chest punctured by large syringes connected by tubes to some kind of pumping machine. The parts connecting this pumping machine to the overall apparatus of the room were missing though, leaving its purpose a mystery. The Foundation assumed that fluids used to be drawn out of this corpse to somehow power the machine. You may be starting to worry that there doesn't seem to be any answers here, that this house is one big mystery. But lucky for you, you're wrong. An old journal was also discovered in the Catalyst Room. 
and if what was written inside is to be believed, then we may finally have some truth about who created the House of the Worm, why it was created, and what horrible events triggered its mysterious disappearance and reappearance. His true name has been redacted by the Foundation, and special efforts have been made to maintain secrecy around the house, seeing as it's an anomaly of great interest to a cult known as the Church of the Broken God. So we'll just call the one who made this place the Inventor. Before any of this, the Inventor was one of the many Englishmen traumatized and almost killed in the horrific trench battles of World War I. After a near-death experience, the Inventor, like many geniuses and madmen, was plagued by surreal and nightmarish visions. He saw a huge creature that he referred to as the Worm, a gigantic metal monstrosity with dragon-like jaws full of gnashing gears that rampaged through Europe, destroying and devouring everything in its path. These apocalyptic visions also presented him with a solution, vague blueprints for a machine that might be the salvation of him and others willing to take his new gospel to heart an escape from a world that the inventor knew in his heart was about to end. He hired work-starved laborers from across the country to help him make his visions a reality, and began a massive secret construction project beneath his isolated country manor house. For the inventor, it was all a labor of love. He wanted to protect his wife, son, and daughter from the terrible jaws of the worm. But as the project stretched on, his wife began to suspect that he'd lost his mind. Many of his workers, however, felt just the opposite. They became infatuated by the inventor's sermons on the nature of the worm and the coming apocalypse they hoped to escape. Soon enough, they had become a bona fide cult, constructing the elaborate sublevels underneath the house in preparation for the fast approaching day of reckoning. Then came World War II. The inventor saw Hitler, hungry for war, as one of the avatars of the worm. Finally, knowing that the time was right, he activated the machine and successfully trapped the worm in the bowels of his mechanized home. However, as the Blitz raged and London's bombing began, the inventor felt as though he hadn't stopped anything. He realized once and for all that he was never meant to stop the apocalypse, only escape it. And by throwing the final switch and setting the machine he and his followers had built into overdrive, he did just that. This was the moment that the House of the Worm disappeared, transporting the inventor, his family, and his devoted staff to a different world. An empty gray world, devoid of war but also lacking all the comforts of regular life, including food. Things went downhill from there, as their supplies quickly began to run out, and the cult descended into cannibalism in order to survive. Things weren't going much better in the inventor's personal life. His wife, fearing what would happen to the family, took her own life and the life of his daughter. Though by this point, the inventor's mind was so fractured that it's possible he may have killed them himself. Either way, it was only the inventor and his son left, and more trouble was brewing. Eudora, one of the staff trapped in the building with the inventor and his cult, started a mutiny. She claimed the worm spoke to her from below, and that their only path to salvation was pleasing the worm. How would they please it? A sacrifice, of course. They would give it the son of the man who had trapped it. The mutineers took the inventor's only remaining child and descended into the lowest sub-levels. The inventor followed, hoping to track them down, save his son, and salvage something from this nightmare. As he ventured deeper, battling the members of Eudora's new cult, he found that they were changing themselves, becoming the half-human cyborg creatures that the Foundation would later discover. The inventor would find Eudora herself in the speaking tube room, her body, still living, was wired into the machinery, and she had sacrificed his son to the worm. In a rage, the inventor murdered Eudora, or whatever was left of her, then heard a familiar voice speaking out of a nearby speaking tube. It said, I am what you have made me. I am then, and I am now. I am choice, and I am tyranny. I am evil, and I am flesh. I am beauty, and I am chaos. I am the worm. The voice was his own. In that terrible moment, the inventor realized that the worm wasn't a giant all-devouring monster. It was him. In trying to protect his loved one from a perceived apocalypse, he'd brought them all to their horrible demise. He'd trapped them with the monster he'd hoped for them all to escape from, because no matter what you build, you can't escape from who you are. 
Grief-stricken and broken, the inventor descended into the catalyst room. There was his son, stuck with the syringes, drained of all life to fuel the mighty machine his father had created. In his last moments, the inventor decided to do the only noble thing. He threw himself into the machine, destroying both it and himself in the process. The house was transported back to our own reality, but the worm, in a sense, was no more. But who knows if the worm is really dead? Its thoughts and poisonous intent still lingers in the caverns and rattles through the speaking pipes. Whatever really happened, the Foundation is still picking up the pieces today, and who knows what lurks in the parts still hidden from our knowledge. We've all heard of the Led Zeppelin song Stairway to Heaven, a title that invokes the image of a stairway leading up to a land of peace and paradise. But where else could a stairway lead? To a dusty attic full of old photo albums? To the upper level of a mall where the movie theater and frozen yogurt shop are neatly situated? Perhaps it leads to a rooftop with a beautiful view. Or maybe, just maybe, a staircase could lead you to SCP-2427. SCP-2427, appropriately nicknamed a thing full of stuff, is an extra-dimensional area filled with a variety of unusual and anomalous objects. SCP-2427 can be accessed by way of a broken stone staircase located in rural Ohio. According to local legend, Carrying a sprig of hemlock up the broken stairs will allow a person to emerge into a mysterious grass clearing that appears to be in a forest somewhere in the United States. No matter what time a person ascends the staircase, the solar time in the clearing will always be 2 p.m. You know how people say it's 5 o'clock somewhere? Well, it's 2 o'clock somewhere too, and that somewhere is here. The pocket dimension that is SCP-2427 is thought to have been a holding area for weapons, prisoners, and artifacts belonging to an ancient cult known as the Brazen Heart. Little is known about this relatively obscure cult, other than the fact that they worship the demonic entity Moloch, a known enthusiast of violent human sacrifice, and were previously thought to have been eradicated during the Spanish Inquisition. The existence of SCP-2427 suggests that they are very much not eradicated, and are still active. They refer to these holding areas as attics, and though no confirmed members of the Brazen Heart have been contacted, it is considered possible that there are at least a handful of other attics hidden around the world. The Foundation has identified seven anomalous objects inside of SCP-2427 so far, each strange in its own beautiful, though often terrible, way. Like snowflakes, if they were capable of killing or maiming you. The first object in SCP-2427, aka SCP-2427-1, is a seemingly normal fire hydrant. However, if you think there's anything normal about the items found here, then you haven't been paying attention. The hydrant is made out of lead, and when opened, it expels high levels of ionized radiation. No specific measurements of the radiation have been taken yet, but it is definitely hazardous to human health. One unfortunate member of D-Class personnel has proven that it is a high enough level to melt human flesh. Sorry about your face, Dave. The hydrant is currently contained within an electrified perimeter and is not to be opened under any circumstances to prevent any further flesh melting. The last thing we need is another Dave incident. The second object contained within SCP-2427 or SCP-2427-2 is not actually an object at all. It's a building. Only on number two and we're already throwing curveballs at you. Trust no one. Surprises lurk around every corner. This particular building resembles a large multi-storied sanitarium built in the 1860s. Though it is clear from the outside that the building has or should have multiple stories, the inside is a different matter. Past the building's front doors is a non-Euclidean space consisting of a single floor and three sparsely decorated rooms with one central foyer. The first room is the holding place for SCP-2427-3. The second contains SCP-2427-4, and the third room contains nothing except scattered religious documents, bottled water, and a selection of canned food. No unauthorized staff are permitted to enter the building, in order to minimize complications or potential employee casualties. The first two anomalies on this list are hardly even strange by SCP Foundation standards. 
Sure, the hydrant can melt your face, and the building defies the laws of physics and space, but that's just a regular Tuesday around these parts. Huh, <sighs> been there, seen that. What else you got? Well, SCP-2427-3 is where things really get strange. If you're wandering through the bowels of SCP-2427-2 and you make a wrong turn into the first room, you will find yourself face to face with a startling sight. This entity is a combination of electronic circuitry, a cow's digestive tract, the hairless head of a human man, a hat rack, several lengths of garden hose, and an unidentified crystalline structure. This creature is extraordinarily fast and strong, exhibiting carnivorous tendencies and a very strong point of view on the world around it. Lucky for us, it is capable of speech and is able to tell us just what it thinks. Though this monstrosity doesn't have much of a right to pass judgment on anyone, cow intestine body and all, it has expressed a violent hatred of all life that it considers impure. Anyone who encounters SCP-2427-3 experiences an overwhelming desire to submit themselves for judgment, allowing the creature to determine their purity. There is a rumor that if one is judged to be pure, they will have a wish granted. If they are deemed impure, however, they will be devoured alive. If you're tempted to introduce yourself to the creature, your odds are not especially great. The creature has not encountered a single pure being yet. In order to protect the Foundation staff working in its vicinity, the entrance to SCP-2427-3's room has been sealed off with a reinforced steel door, and the windows have been paved over with concrete. Armed guards are watching the entrance at all times. The creature must be fed one live goat per day in order to keep its appetite satiated. The Foundation's goat budget is through the roof these days, but it's worth it to keep the thing contained. Better to spend money on goats now and not spend money on cannibalized personnel later. SCP-2427-4 consists not of an object located within a room, but the room itself. The room, which contains no furniture and a linoleum floor, has a peculiar effect on the human psyche. Once a person steps foot into the room, they lose consciousness for five minutes. During this time, they will speak freely, listing off a variety of negative qualities about themselves. Once they wake up, they have no memory of entering the state or anything that they said during it. It's cheaper than therapy, right? But it's also much weirder and less effective, so you get what you pay for in the end. A member of D-Class personnel who was observed inside of the room wax poetic about his personal failings, beginning his monologue with, My soul is a den of spiders, and ending it with, Oh, here, once I awaken, hesitate not to feed my flesh and my soul to the Judge Beast. Somebody give this guy a hug. Because the room seems to have no adverse effects on human test subjects, except for causing everyone who hears their monologue a bit of discomfort. There are no containment procedures in effect for it at this time. We've had rooms, fire hydrants, and horrible meat-robot hybrids. And now? You can't even trust the clouds in the sky. SCP-2427-5 is a seemingly innocent cloud, hovering stationary over the building. When looked at by a human for more than three seconds, the cloud will eject a ball of solid lead towards the person at a supersonic speed. That's right, folks. This cloud can and will shoot you. It hates being observed, but it also hates when you try to leave the perimeter. It will attack any person attempting to leave by firing the same lead ball at them. So far, 14 personnel have been killed by this highly aggressive cloud. And some people still think thunderstorms and hail are the worst things clouds have to offer. So naive. As it is a literal cloud, there is no way to contain it, so no people in the vicinity of the cloud are permitted to look at it for more than three seconds at a time. SCP-2427-6 is a series of 18 small trees, spread throughout the instance of SCP-2427. Above ground, the trees look normal, though their species has proven surprisingly difficult to determine. From an external perspective, they are simply ordinary trees. However, radar analysis revealed that the roots of these trees are deeply strange. Instead of the usual twisting tree roots, the ground below these trees contains a mass in the shape of a human body. Much to the disgust of the observing researchers, these humanoid masses occasionally twitch and move, as if alive. The trees themselves appear to be growing from the crotch area of each humanoid figure. How's that for Morningwood? I know, I get it, bad joke. 
This arrangement between tree and person seems to be some kind of punishment, as each tree is marked with a plaque reading, the letras suffer what they must, and it is beautiful. Until it can be certain that the condition of these human roots is not contagious, these trees are to be treated as potential biohazards and isolated in individual containers. The final object in SCP-2427 currently categorized by the Foundation is SCP-2427-7. SCP-2427-7 is a pile of ashes and wood located just behind a posted sign that reads, The Liar's Cradle. Extensive testing has been established that the Liar's Cradle was almost certainly used as a torture device in interrogations performed by the Brazen Heart. A person standing within the boundaries of the cradle, which encompasses the aforementioned circle of wood and ashes, is unable to lie without suffering the consequences. Namely, they will be set on fire. The nature of how exactly the liar's cradle works is not certain, and more research needs to be done on it. However, this much is known for sure. It contains no sentient intelligence. It is not aware of what it is doing. It does not kill its victims, rather it keeps them miraculously alive as it sets them on fire, prolonging their agony and allowing their interrogators to get the truth out of them. A series of experiments reveal that it only immolates a person who is knowingly lying. D-Class personnel give demonstrably false information to repeat in the cradle without knowledge of its falsehood were not set on fire. However, when those same D-Class personnel knowingly lied in the boundaries, they immediately were set ablaze. It is almost certain that the Brazen Heart Cult used the cradle as a method of interrogating presumed liars in their midst. Further investigation will likely reveal human remains beneath the cradle itself, though this is just a hypothesis currently. But come on, there has to be some bones somewhere beneath something as ominous as the liar's cradle. Though they have only identified seven anomalies inside SCP-2427 at the moment, there are plenty more lurking in there, waiting to be discovered. In the foyer of SCP-2427-2, the Foundation discovered an extremely ominous list of items, clearly belonging to members of the Cult of the Brazen Heart. This list included some familiar items, such as Pilgrim Provisions, also known as the canned beans and soup found in SCP-2427-2, a level 3 purity proctor, a purge engine disguised as a fire hydrant, and the liar's cradle. However, it also contained many things that have not yet been discovered, such as one slaughtering perseverance, 27 pyre children, three ascended cultivars, seven supreme angelics, nine dragons, and the brazen heart itself. Dr. Gordon McElroy, site director of Area 2427, put out a memo to all level four and higher staff assigned to the area after the discovery of this list. Understandably, he was most concerned about the supreme angelics and the dragons, particularly the latter. The cult, as most cults are, is fond of deliberately obscure language, but you don't want to rule out the possibility they've got a fire-breathing lizard or two stashed away. In the meantime, as the Foundation is working to better understand the contents of SCP-2427, the area has been sealed off to the public. A 500-meter perimeter has been established around its entrance, and a fake private country club has been set up as a front. It's only a matter of time before the rest of the anomalies on the list are discovered, and this thing full of stuff gets even fuller of even more stuff. Let's just hope none of it ever gets out, because if there are more of these addicts out there, who knows what else the Brazen Heart is hiding? Their little cult may not be as extinct as we thought. You're right in the middle of one of the hottest summers on record. The days are filled with bright, scorching sun and searing heat, and you've been laying around with your air conditioning on full blast just to try and cool yourself off. Sadly, it's not really working, and the heat is becoming way too much. But then you remember there's this married couple that lives near you, with no kids, and they happen to have a swimming pool in their yard. Normally, they keep to themselves. They'd never let you use their pool but they've gone out of town for a few days. Besides, the heat is killing you. You're sure that the neighbors wouldn't mind if you just took a quick dip, as long as you clean up after yourself. They probably wouldn't even notice you were even there. Cautiously, you make your way to their house. It's an unremarkable place similar to most of the other houses in this suburb of New Mexico. 
After checking that there's nobody else around, you climb the two meter high cinder block wall that stands around the back garden. As you drop to your feet, sweaty and panting from the unrelenting summer heat, you see it. The pool. Your salvation. Water never looks so appealing. Immediately, you step barefoot across the sun-scorched tiles and sit on the edge, legs in the water. It's cool and refreshing, perfect for a day as hot as today. You're already changed and wearing your swim trunks, so it doesn't take long for you to paddle out to the middle of the pool, letting that chilled, clean water cool you off. As you're taking a dip, you notice the pool's jets turning on automatically. It's a little bit odd, but you shrug it off. That couple clearly shelled out for a pool with a lot of fancy bells and whistles. But extra features aren't why you're here. You came because if you didn't, then you could have melted under all that sunlight. Floating on the surface of the water, you relax with your arms behind your head and close your eyes. You don't have time to realize that coming here was a mistake. Instead, you start to feel relaxed, so calm, so tranquil. You're one with the water around you now. It's almost as though you could just disappear. So, you do. The police never find any trace of you. Everyone else simply writes it off as a random disappearance. There's not even so much as a scrap of your body left in the pool. Just the clear, clean water. Why? Because the swimming pool you decided to take a cooling dip in wasn't an ordinary pool. It was SCP-242. But don't worry. You won't be the last to make that costly mistake. What you didn't know is that the married couple who live in that house are secretly a pair of SCP Foundation doctors. The house isn't even theirs. The Foundation procured it after the former owner, a retired out-of-state landlord, strangely vanished. He had been struggling to find anyone to rent the place, so he eventually decided to give up on the property game and move in there himself. After three days, he was never seen again. Now that house has only one rule that must be followed above all else. Do not swim in the pool. SCP-242 is, at least to the untrained eye, just an average swimming pool. A decent 9 meters in length, 4.5 wide, and it holds around 53,000 liters of sterile pool water. Like we mentioned before, it's even got some nifty features like water jets, a dual waterfall, and a built-in vacuum unit for sucking out any impurities. And we mean any impurities. You see, SCP-242 does go by another name, the self-cleaning pool. And while that might not sound as foreboding or dramatic as the Scarlet King or the Wendigo Skull or the horrifying nasty dude of ultimate badness, okay, we made that last one up, we can assure you that you don't ever want to suffer the fate of taking a swim in this pool. There was an incident a while ago, recorded by the Foundation through a secret hidden camera. The house where SCP-242 can be found had been left vacant for a time, and once again some opportunists decided to take advantage of the empty swimming pool. This time it was a couple, a man and a woman in their early 20s. They climbed up the back wall, undressed, and even stole a couple of plastic inflatable rafts from a shed in the house's backyard. The water jets switched themselves on, startling the girl, but her boyfriend told her not to worry. The filter to clean the pool was probably just on an automatic timer, right? Surely it wouldn't have been anything to worry about. After swimming together for around 24 minutes, the couple both agreed that the water felt warm, tingly even. Both of them climbed onto their rafts, eventually falling asleep while still holding each other's hands. But almost half an hour after the jets had started, something caused the two rafts to burst. The couple awoke, startled by the loud pop of the splitting inflatables and being plunged back into the water. The pool around them immediately began frothing violently, deep red streams of blood swirling through the water as the couple screamed in fear and agony. Both of them tried to desperately swim to the edge, hoping to leave the pool and get to safety. But unfortunately, that plan didn't work. Before they could reach the edge, the man and the woman were pulled under the surface of the raging water, their limbs thrashing as they still tried in vain to escape. Eventually, they vanished under the crimson, bloody water. The frothing slowly began to calm, and the red in the pool dissipated, once again becoming clear after 48 seconds. The couple were never seen again, and a cover story was leaked to the press by the SCP Foundation two weeks after they went missing. 
According to them, the pair had eloped together somewhere in Mexico. If only. That sounds a lot nicer than what actually happened to them. So this swimming pool clearly has some anomalous properties, that much is obvious. But what exactly are those properties? How exactly does SCP-242 work? Is it an interdimensional gateway that drags people to a nasty alternate universe if they spend too long swimming in it? Or is the swimming pool itself a sentient carnivorous creature that lures humans in only to devour them? Maybe the water is teeming with invisible flesh-eating piranhas that can strip the meat from the bone in a matter of seconds. Well, good guesses all around, but actually, it's none of these. It's unclear what causes the pool's anomalous effects. It could be a property that is completely unique to the water contained in SCP-242. Or maybe it's down to the exact shape and measurements of the pool itself. It could even be a combination of both. But whatever the cause, the result is always the same. When any object, substance, or even living organism is placed in SCP-242, it will be entirely rewritten on a molecular level. The genetic anatomic structure will fall apart, and the subject will be transmuted into sterile water. In fact, not just clean water, but water that remains sterile even when removed from the pool. If you took a cup of SCP-242's water and mixed something like food coloring into it, the food coloring would not be absorbed into the water, instead staying as one non-missable bubble. This process doesn't happen instantly, though. It can vary depending on how contaminated or complex the substance placed in SCP-242 is. For example, water sampled from a nearby river was sterilized and purified by the pool in about seven minutes. A sample of stagnant pond water riddled with various diseases and germs took 11 minutes longer. What about 50,000 liters of coal tar? Well, that one took a little longer. 12 long days, to be exact. But was still turned into pure, sterile water. And as for a living human being? Maybe ask that couple that took a dip in the self-cleaning pool. The Foundation is naturally fascinated with the pool, and after extensive examination, they have determined that SCP-242 doesn't seem to have been intentionally designed for the specific anomalous function it performs. The components of SCP-242 beyond the pool itself, the filter, the vacuum, the pipes, none of these parts nor anything about the swimming pool's design appear to be responsible for disintegrating matter until only water remains. You might have noticed that in the case of the ill-fated couple who took a swim in SCP-242, the water jets and waterfall features switched themselves on automatically before the pair's grim demise. Somehow these features are able to activate without the need for electricity, as disconnecting the pool from a power source will not stop the jets and waterfall from coming on once a non-water substance is placed into SCP-242. The same goes for the pool vacuum, which apparently cannot be jammed or malfunction. Even when the bottom of the pool is awash with viscous liquids like that coal tar, the vacuum will continue to operate as normal, scrubbing away at the floor of SCP-242. The one part of the self-cleaning pool that doesn't work as you would expect is the water filtration system. There is never any water being cycled into the pool nor out of it. As a matter of fact, the pipes connecting to the filtration system have all been removed. Then again, who needs a filtration system when your backyard swimming pool can just spontaneously reduce anything to clean water? But that raises another frightening thought. Everything that the pool has ever taken and converted is still in there. Animals, objects, people, just swimming around you. Perhaps if they could still think, they'd scream and shout and tell you to get away to run while you still can. But the second your skin touches the water, you're destined to be with them forever and ever and ever. It's enough to send a liquid chill down your spine. Okay, so if it's not the actual physical pool that causes these anomalous effects, that must mean it's something in the water, right? Perhaps some microscopic flesh-devouring microbe, or some ancient curse that was placed on the water before it was used to fill up the pool. Surely, if you took a cup of water out of SCP-242, it would still break down structures on a molecular level, leaving only more sterile water. 
While the researchers working at the SCP Foundation thought much of the same and conducted a series of tests to determine the exact properties of SCP-242's water. One test involved submerging two D-Class test subjects, each wearing an atmospheric dive suit, into SCP-242. The goal was to determine if it was safe to consume the water from SCP-242 while both inside and outside of the pool. Test Subject A was lowered into the water and instructed to drink from a metal straw by their mouth. The eyepieces of their goggles were blacked out, so they couldn't see what they were drinking from. Subject B filled a barrel with the same water from SCP-242 and then was made to put on an atmospheric dive suit, but instructed to stay out of the pool. Test Subject A was told to drink directly from the pool, remarking that the water was warm and had a bit of a noticeable chemical aftertaste, but was otherwise normal. Then, Test Subject B drank some of the same water from the barrel. Apparently, it was cool and tasted of… well, nothing, just like water usually does. After a moment more of drink, Subject A began belching, finding that they had uncontrollable gas. The water had begun to feel warmer, stinging the subject's mouth while, for Subject B, the water from the barrel stayed cool and refreshing. The Foundation doctors overseeing the experiment instructed Test Subject A to keep drinking which they did until it felt even hotter to the taste. One of the D-Class's fillings even fell out, and eventually the structural integrity of Subject A's dive suit failed, presumably disintegrated by the water from SCP-242. After a few muffled screams and gurgling noises, Test Subject A wasn't heard from again, and we can all probably guess why. As for Subject B, they kept drinking from the barrel, suffering no adverse effects even after 17 long hours. There were no noticeable psychological or physical changes, even their urine showed no traces of abnormality. The water from SCP-242 left in the barrel evaporated as normal, leaving behind no residue or any indicator as to why taking the water out of the pool made it safer to drink than the same water in the pool. Perhaps the moral of the story is to just be careful where you choose to take a swim. Otherwise, it could be your last. You're on a road trip, the kind that stretches over days on end, and you need to make multiple stops along the way to refuel the car and yourself. The last time you remember stopping to get more gas and a bite to eat was back in Wyoming, and now you're in the heart of Montana. Thankfully, like an oasis in the desert, you see the town of Clearwater off in the distance. It's a vibrant, welcoming little place, a perfect slice of classic small-town Americana. You took a similar trip last year and vaguely remember stopping at Clearwater that time too, and you're glad to be back. In particular, you remember the Old Prairie Diner, a folksy little place with the most delicious huckleberry pie you ever tasted. Perhaps it's about time for you to give it another try. You fill up your tank and stop at the diner. The food tastes just as good as you remember, but one thing is off. The entire staff seems to have changed. It is the exact same diner you ate at a year ago, no doubt about that. But it looks like everyone from the wait staff to the cashier to the cooks have all been replaced. You try your best not to think about it. After all, businesses are allowed to replace their staff. But the longer you sit in the diner, the more uncomfortable the feelings become. You need to ask someone, just to push away the fears that you're not going crazy. When the waiter passes by, you compliment the food and mention you ate here last year too. You ask the unfamiliar waiter if they had worked here back then. They confirm that yes, they've always worked here, and so has everybody else. The diner is a family business. You leave town not too long after that, feeling vaguely unsettled. And as a voice on the radio warns about the incoming rain, you tell yourself that you never want to return to the town of Clearwater, Montana. As you leave, the memory of the town seems to fade from your mind in real time. But little do you know, the people of Clearwater will never be able to leave. Ever. It's because something horrifying will happen in Clearwater every single year. And that thing is known to the SCP Foundation as SCP-3300. This annual anomalous event is Clearwater's own local curse, always occurring around mid-June. While many of the mechanics of this event still elude the Foundation's understanding, the outcome is well documented. Every single inhabitant of the town is replaced by a person who didn't previously exist. While some elements may carry over from their original counterparts, every person involved will simply be a whole new person, with no memories of the change or who they once were. 
The process known as SCP-3300 lasts between 6 and 18 days, and once the process has begun, it's impossible for any outsiders to intervene. It begins with rain, a light, dreary drizzle at first, but each day the rain gets worse. Soon it's a storm, and then a maelstrom. Flooding, hurricanes, tornadoes, all centered around Clearwater but cutting off neatly just beyond it. What happens in Clearwater remains in Clearwater, and when the process has concluded and the sun shines once more, everybody has been changed. Whenever the Foundation has tried to send personnel or equipment into Clearwater during SCP-3300, one of two things has happened. In the more favorable scenarios, those attempting to enter Clearwater have simply appeared on the other side of the city limits. In the less positive instances, personnel and equipment have been lost forever within. There is no stopping or even understanding SCP-3300. According to Foundation records, Clearwater has been around at least as long as the Foundation itself, perhaps even longer. Clearwater has been able to undergo its yearly nightmare without intrusion due to a unique cognitohazardous effect, which creates a kind of mental block around memories of the town for outsiders. You won't forget Clearwater, per se, but you will find it increasingly hard to focus on like something you can only ever see out of the corner of your eye. There is no saving the people of Clearwater. The horror will play out again and again and again. The Foundation has no first-hand knowledge of what happens in Clearwater during those horrifying 18 days, but one account they have hints at a terrifying possibility. During an excursion into Clearwater, the Foundation managed to collect a diary belonging to a woman named Margaret Lane, to the best of our knowledge, Margaret Lane no longer exists. But if the contents of her diary aren't to be believed, then what goes on in Clearwater during SCP-3300 is far worse than we ever imagined. Margaret first started her diary not long before SCP-3300's 1995 iteration began. She was in the middle of a tumultuous time in her life, freshly clean from alcohol and drug addiction, forced to live with her antagonistic mother and having peculiar and distressing dreams. In the first dream Margaret recorded, she was someone else. A woman living in a small hut perhaps a century ago or more. It was plague time. She was looking down upon her daughter, bedridden, her skin covered in painful looking red blotches. Her husband was already dead. That's when another man enters, a healthy man. He tells her that he's found their salvation, and then the dream ended. Margaret woke up to a gray, dreary day. There were clouds on the horizon. The rain was coming. It drizzled for the next few days before getting more intense, as one would expect from an SCP-3300 cycle. Of course, nothing seemed out of place to Margaret. Life carried on. She continued to stay clean, resisting the offers of her old dealer, though her relationship with her mother remained frosty. The rain started to get worse as voices on the radio insisted that conditions would continue to become more severe over the next few days. They tried their best to maintain normality. Margaret invited some friends, Jared, Sam, Mike, and Isabel to come over and play D&D at her place. That was when all hell broke loose. While the group roleplayed, there was a furious banging at the door, like whoever was knocking was trying to bash the door down. When Margaret's mom opened the door to investigate the commotion, she saw that an entire family was standing there, a father, a mother, and two young children. The father immediately began furiously asking why all these strangers were in his house. When Margaret's mother tried to tell him that this wasn't his house, he became increasingly agitated and walked straight into the home. Margaret's friends attempted to subdue him, but he threw them off, displaying a supernatural strength. Margaret's mom ran in with a golf club and struck the mysterious man in the chest. There was a nasty splat, but he didn't seem to react. The golf club was just embedded in his chest, having broken the skin and sunken in. But there was no blood, just dripping water. The father then pulled the golf club out of his chest and began beating Margaret's mother to death with it, all while repeating my house again and again while his wife and children watched with broad, sunny smiles in the rain. Somehow Margaret knew that her mother was beyond saving, and that there was no way of defeating these things in a physical confrontation. All they could do was run out to Jared's van with the rest of the group and hightail it to the police station. But when they arrived at the station, the doors were barred and it appeared empty. As the torrential rain hammered down from above, 
There was nothing left to do but drive out of town and try to escape whatever madness was going on here. But that was easier said than done. They drove for what seemed like hours on end as the rain and the howling wind persisted. Jared had been injured during the fight with the strange family, and his health deteriorated further as the drive stretched on. They should have left the town of Clearwater a long time ago, but it seemed like they were nowhere. It wasn't long before Jared was lying dead in the back of the van, and now there were only four of them left. They kept driving, afraid, grieving, hungry, and tired, and Margaret took the opportunity to sleep. It was no time to rest, but she was so exhausted that she had no choice. Margaret had a continuation of her earlier dream. The different her, the dream her, was laying the plague-ridden body of her daughter in the river, but she wasn't the only one. All the villages of her settlement were placing the bodies of their dead in the river as the water washed around them and through them. The bodies became one with the water, and then they became the water. The water was everything. When Margaret awoke, it was to the horrifying sounds of bubbling and boiling. That's when she saw that Jared's body was dissolving. No, not dissolving, evaporating. It was bubbling and convulsing like it was made of water until the entire thing burst into a cascade of hot steam. After that, Margaret and the others left the vehicle and refused to get back inside. Nothing was making sense. It was like something out of a nightmare. As they walked, the rain hammered down upon them. They couldn't have been walking for more than a mile when they crashed into something. It was a sign, welcome to Clearwater. It was like that the town itself had drawn them back. Mike refused to return to the town of his own free will and began walking in the other direction. Moments later, he was walking back towards them in silence, though he'd never intended to. SCP-3300 had distorted his path and brought him back. It was clear that Mike was shaken to the core by the experience, but they had to press on. They would head to the grocery store for food, and then to a sporting goods store where they could hopefully grab some guns to fight the violent, altered people who'd somehow appeared with the rain. But things didn't go to plan, or what little plan there even was. Mike shot himself on the first night at Dirk's Sporting Goods, leaving only Margaret, Sam, and Isabel alive. Perhaps one of the most terrifying details of Mike's death was the fact he didn't even bleed. Instead, the gaping exit wound in the back of his head was just full of water. Water was all that seemed to be left of them. Sam, seemingly driven to the edge by the sight of Mike's death, grabbed a hunting knife to perform an experiment. She'd cut it into her own skin, and was horrified to see only water dripping out. They'd all been changed, and they didn't know why. That's when the survivors noticed something else. There were people standing outside in the rain, hundreds of them, not a single one they could recognize. All new people, waiting. Sam said only one word, outside, before walking out of the hunting goods store and disappearing into the crowd in the rain, never to be seen again. Margaret mused that perhaps in the end, she had the right idea. To be taken, killed, erased, or changed would be inevitable. In the final entry in Margaret's diary, dreams blend with reality as her mind finally gives out from the terror. She realizes in her final moments that there is no way out. There is no escape. There is only water. Water is eternal. The rain is eternal. All will be changed. And given the fact that no trace of Margaret was ever found save for her diary, all her fears turned out to be right. She was taken and replaced by SCP-3300 just as will inevitably happen to all the current citizens of Clearwater the next time SCP-3300 rolls around. It will be as inevitable and as indifferent to those it affects as tomorrow's sunrise. You cannot change the rain, but believe us, in Clearwater, Montana, the rain can change you. There's a monster under my bed. Almost every parent has heard their kids make the claim, and it's usually nothing more than some unusual shadows, or at worst, a household pest scurrying around. Parents usually tell their child to go back to sleep, or maybe try to dispel their fears by shining a light under the bed. It's a childhood rite of passage, and one that usually passes soon enough. But for one young woman in Missouri, the monster under her bed was very real, and very dangerous. SCP-3887-8 doesn't seem like she belongs in a containment facility. 
She's a 24-year-old woman who lived a quiet life in her hometown until things went horribly wrong. She doesn't appear to possess any special abilities and the Foundation is able to contain her without any difficulty. But wherever she goes, death and destruction follow. It's not her doing. But there is something out there that will not stand to see her hurt in any way. Her personal monster under the bed is very protective. Something another young woman found out the hard way. Incident 3887-A-1 occurred in 2014, when the young woman was attending a party with her girlfriend. Her partner was berating and humiliating her in front of the guests, which was apparently not a rare occurrence in their relationship. Suddenly, something manifested under a nearby table and before she could react, her girlfriend was brutally mauled by the unknown creature. Her limbs were completely severed from her body and she died at the scene. An undercover SCP agent who was implanted within the local authorities made their way to the scene as soon as possible and found SCP-3887-A in a state of shock. And who could blame her? After the encounter she just had with what would become to be known as SCP-3887-B. While 3887-A is a normal human with no unusual abilities or characteristics, 3887-B is anything but. Foundation scientists have described it as a humanoid entity standing over 7 feet tall. Its skin is greenish-gray, and it has two long, sharp horns on its head. Its head and neck are covered in thick black hair, and its eyes are a striking yellow color. Its mouth is full of sharp fangs similar to that of a shark, and its elongated arms allow it to move on all fours. It has a long, hairless tail that resembles a rat's, and possesses both male and female reproductive organs. No one knows where it came from, but they do have an idea why it's sticking around. SCP-3887-B seems to be bonded to SCP-3887-A and can appear in any darkened area within a 5-meter radius around her. While its favorite location is under 3887-A's bed, which has since been brought to the facility, it appears to be able to teleport wherever she is, just as it did during the party where it made its presence brutally clear. It has odd eating patterns and is able to gain nourishment from practically any object, whether it resembles what we would consider food or not. Its favorite treats, for example, SCP-3887-A's socks, but it does have one weakness that has been useful in containing it. It can't stand the light, and it doesn't just hate it. When SCP-3887-B is exposed to bright light, it develops blisters and wounds and flees to the nearest dark area. SCP Foundation scientists are at a loss to explain exactly what this creature is, though. And SCP-3887-B seems to be a chimera of multiple animals with multiple types of DNA. It possesses DNA similar to humans, but also from a type of oryx with similar horns, as well as a rat with the same type of tail as well as a common cane toad, and there's even some DNA that doesn't resemble any creature in nature. Studying it further has been trickier, though, because it seems to have the effect of disrupting any electronic recording devices near it, causing lasting damage if it's in proximity to them for too long. There has been one good bit of news for SCP scientists, though, because while it has shown that it can be extremely violent, it has not attacked Foundation officials. Not yet, at least. Its good behavior may not have anything to do with how it personally feels about Foundation staff, though, and is instead all thanks to SCP-3887-A. 3887-A has been completely cooperative since she was taken into custody by the Foundation. She doesn't perceive them as a threat, and so far it seems like SCP-3887-B is following her lead. It has a strong emotional connection to the young woman, and when they're alone, they show affectionate behavior towards each other. While the creature does not seem to like the Foundation, it doesn't seem like it wants to become hostile, until the Foundation gives it a reason to. When 3887-A was interviewed following the tragic incident by undercover Foundation agent Bellamy, she was panicked and terrified. She admitted that her partner often treated her badly, and believed that the creature was trying to protect her. She admitted that she had seen the creature before, she even had a name for it. She called her Grenda. 
3887-J thought she was crazy. Now there was proof, though. She was not imagining the monster under her bed. Describing Grenda as her boogeyman, the young woman talked about how she had known the creature since she was a child. She grew up in an old house in the country that was full of strange sounds that made it sound like something was in her room with her. And sometimes she would even catch a glimpse of what she thought was a monster under her bed watching her. She tried telling her parents, but they thought she was making the whole thing up. And even she was forced to wonder if she was hallucinating or had somehow imagined the whole thing. But then when she was a teenager, all of her doubts were put to bed. One night, 3887-A's parents were loudly fighting, a sadly not rare occurrence in their household, and she locked herself in her room to get away from them. As she hid, Grenda emerged from under her bed for the first time and talked with her. And she isn't the only one that Grenda is willing to speak with. She's also sat down for her own interviews with Foundation researchers. Well, the researchers sat down while Grenda remained under the bed. Foundation researcher Dr. Tanner interviewed Grenda, who was cordial but guarded, and remained deeply protective of the girl under her protection. She expressed feeling guilty for getting 3887-A in trouble, but Dr. Tanner assured her that 3887-A was not being punished and was being kept at the Foundation for her own safety. He offered that they could keep Grenda safe as well, but she responded that as long as 3887-A remained safe, then she would be as well. She explained that her kind fed on the anxiety of children, which was why they lurked under their beds. She was apparently only supposed to remain with this girl until she was 10 or so, but became attached and decided to stay with her, which was against the rules of her people, and as a result she had been exiled from her home. At this point, Grenda offered to show herself to the researcher and began to emerge from under the bed. Unfortunately, as has become standard when attempting to document SCP-3887-B, all of the recording equipment malfunctioned and was unable to record Grenda's appearance. The Foundation continued to have questions about this pair and their strange relationship and interviewed SCP-3887-A again, this time by a Dr. Garden. 3887-A told Dr. Garden that she had been sleeping well and had been spending lots of time talking to the entity under her bed. That led Dr. Garden to bring up a theory about how SCP-3887-B had come to exist. The young woman speculated that Grenda may have been created from her fears. One of her first memories of being scared was when she went to an aquarium and a massive bull shark came close to the glass where it bared its rows and rows of shark teeth, the exact same kind of teeth that Grenda possessed. In fact, all of the traits Grenda exhibited, like her rat tail, seemed to connect to childhood fears that she had experienced. 3887-A always felt alone as a little girl, and she believed that she might have manifested Grenda as a companion who was there exactly when she needed her to be. This raised the question of whether SCP-3887-B really was the unnatural entity, or if SCP-3887-A is the source of the entity's existence. The next interview with SCP-3887-B would raise even more questions. When Dr. Garden went to interview SCP-3887-B, it was clear that the entity was agitated. Grenda became hostile as soon as Dr. Garden entered the room, saying she was hungry and didn't want to answer questions. When Dr. Garden said that 3887-A had provided it with socks, the entity reacted with anger. The socks were just a snack. To live, it needed fear. 3887-B fed off human emotions, specifically paranoia and anxiety. SCP-3887-A used to be full of them, but now she was unusually calm in the facility, and it was having a bad effect on her companion. When Dr. Garden promised to talk to supervisors, the creature became more agitated and reached out from under the bed, grabbing Dr. Garden and pulling her under the bed. No one knew what would happen to Dr. Garden under the bed, and SCP-3887-A was quickly summoned to try to calm her companion down. But when she called for Grenda, there was no response. It was feared that Dr. Garden had been lost to the area under the bed that no one can access. But then 13 minutes later, 
the doctor suddenly emerged from under the bed. She was bruised, soaking wet, and missing articles including shoes, socks, and her glasses. Later interviews with Dr. Garden would give the best picture yet of where SCP-3887-B comes from. Dr. Garden described being pulled under the bed, which then led somewhere else entirely. She fell for 15 seconds, still being held by SCP-3887-B. But when she landed, she was alone in a large cave made of black rock with purple gems in the walls. The cave contained a waterfall, a lake, and what looked like SCP-3887's secret home. It was filled with pictures of the girl she was bonded to, a violin, some stuffed animals, and large piles of the girl's socks. SCP-3887-B was there in the cave with her too, watching her. She would catch glimpses of the creature, her white fangs and her yellow eyes. She was terrified and ran screaming, trying to find any way out of there as the creature pursued her. She couldn't evade her forever though, and eventually Grenda grabbed Dr. Garden. She was lifted into the air as Grenda bared her shark-like teeth. But instead of eating her, the creature instead took off the doctor's socks and thanked her before somehow sending her back up into the darkness. She then found herself back under the bed, surrounded by worried SCP personnel. Since then, SCP-3887-B has not brought anyone else into its home. It seems feeding on Dr. Garden's fear was enough for the time being, and the situation has remained stable since. The SCP Foundation has been able to develop relatively simple containment procedures for the two entities that make up SCP-3887, as neither is currently hostile. The two are contained within a standard humanoid containment cell, with the bed at the center. SCP-3887-A is given standard amenities, a healthy diet including a vitamin for some minor health issues, and her own control over the lights in the cell. She has requested and been given a gaming system for entertainment and up-to-date entertainment media, but was denied access to the internet, a pet cat, and access to the on-site recreation areas due to the risk of SCP-3887-B getting loose. The facility does have plans in place in case Grenda decides to become hostile again, though. While SCP-3887-A normally maintains control of the lights in her cell, the Foundation has a failsafe installed so they can turn them up at any time. Since SCP-3887-B reacts negatively to bright light, the lights can be used as a security system to send her retreating back under the bed until she can be pacified through other measures. While neither of the SCP-3887 entities appears to be seeking to escape, it is impossible to predict where and how 3887-B would act if 3887-A was free from her cell again, and whether she would attempt to harm those she perceives as a threat to 3887-A as she did in the past. So for now, the Foundation is focused on keeping both of them pacified, which in the case of 3887-B means a healthy supply of socks. But there's one other lingering question the Foundation hasn't solved. SCP-3887-B referenced being exiled from its kin for breaking the rules and was confined to a cave. That means there might be others like Grenda out there, and they may be more aggressive and less scrupulous than she is. While no other specimens have been found, the SCP Foundation will be keeping a careful eye on any reports of monsters lurking under children's beds. They might just be telling the truth. Lots of people believe in the possibility of past lives, the notion that the life we are currently living is not our first. Before you were the person you are now, sitting at home and watching this video, maybe you were a medieval king, a renaissance painter, or an ancient Spartan warrior. Past life regression is a controversial practice that allows people to look back at their supposed past lives looking through the eyes of someone in another lifetime. It is a nice idea, and there's something exciting about the possibility of reliving the experiences of a person from the past. And wouldn't you know it, the SCP Foundation just so happened to discover an artifact that allows a person to experience another person's memories. It is not past life regression, and you have no control over whose life you're peeking into but it allows you to look at the world through their eyes. 
However, when you look through someone else's eyes, there's always the possibility that you will see something you didn't want to. Something troubling, frightening, even traumatic, or worse. So you may not want to subject yourself to SCP-1123, or as it has been ominously nicknamed, the Atrocity Skull. SCP-1123 is an old human skull with no teeth or lower jaw. Across the forehead region of the skull, the Khmer word for remember is written in blood. Testing of the skull and blood determined it was from the 1970s, and that both the blood and skull belonged to the same person. The atrocity skull was discovered by a colonel in the Vietnamese People's Army in the 1980s, as part of a collection of human remains displayed in a Cambodian museum. Struck by the bloody writing and the peculiar feeling that the skull gave him, the colonel decided to send it to Hanoi for further investigation. While in transit, though, the skull was intercepted by the SCP Foundation. Foundation agents set a trap along the road, blowing out the tires of the colonel's transportation. The skull was taken and sent to a Foundation facility, and the colonel was given an amnestic to remove all memory of the skull's discovery. The staff of the Cambodian Museum received a similar treatment. All written memories of the skull were erased, and now outside of the Foundation's archives, there is no official record of the skull ever having existed. The bloody writing on the skull has faded over time and from a distance is barely visible at all. The first SCP Foundation agent to study the skull, an unknown researcher whose name has since been scrubbed from the Foundation archives, had a series of unusual experiences while observing the skull. He reported that the script was invisible from five meters away. As he approached it, he noted that the writing became clearer with each meter he got closer, until at one meter away, the writing looked fresh. Unable to stop himself, he reached out to touch it, and found that his fingers came away slick and red. Somehow, the bloody writing was still wet, as if it had been drawn only moments before. As soon as he touched the text, he began to experience anomalous sensory phenomena. The room filled with the smell of smoke. He could hear the sound of heavy breathing and the pounding of a heartbeat. There were thundering footsteps behind him, and he turned to look, but found nothing there. He jerked his hand back away from the skull, recoiling at the sensation of ants crawling over the back of his hand. His eyes began to sting as if filled with ash, and he stumbled backward, only to fall to the ground from a sudden stabbing sensation, like a shard of glass piercing his shoe and the sole of his foot. The researcher was removed from the room and examined by a physician, who found that none of these sensations had accompanying physical symptoms. They were purely psychosomatic, so it seemed. There was nothing in his eyes, no wound on his foot. Contact with the skull had caused him to experience these physical stimuli, but it was all in his head. And this was far from the full extent of SCP-1123's impact on those who interacted with it. After several weeks untouched, the skull was examined by yet another Foundation researcher. When she touched the surface of the skull to lift it and take a closer look, she fell into a dissociative fugue state, a kind of distressing altered state of consciousness. She became confused, disoriented, and wouldn't respond to her name. The skull was removed from her grasp as soon as she became unresponsive, but this did nothing to return her to normal. The accompanying researchers simply had to observe her and wait for her to wake up. Six hours later, when she finally did, she recounted what she experienced after touching the skull. She claimed that she had seen the life of another person in the time between touching the skull and returning to consciousness. She could recount details of this other person's life, describing places she had never been, events she had never witnessed, and even speaking a language she had previously demonstrated no command of. The other researchers determined that the person described actually had existed, though they had since passed away, and that all the little details were too specific to be a simple coincidence. After this encounter with SCP-1123, several other researchers experienced similarly traumatic fugue states. The Foundation was able to identify several shared characteristics among those who touched the skull and experienced the life of another person. All of the people whose memories were seen by test subjects died before the subject was born, were a victim of violence or imprisonment, 
died in a tragic or violent way by murder, starvation, or infection, and died as a result of being targeted by a political movement. These patterns led to the coining of the SCP's nickname, the Atrocity Skull. It is a skull that forces those who touch it to relive past atrocities. In order to further understand the nature of the skull's effects on test subjects and the nature of the lives it imprints on them, a series of experiments were performed by the Foundation. Various people of differing cultural backgrounds were exposed to the skull in an attempt to determine what correlation, if any, there is between someone exposed to the skull and the type of person whose memories they experience. In the first experiment, a man of Irish and French ancestry was told to touch the skull. He immediately collapsed and began to scream in Armenian and resist any and all assistance from Foundation officers. When he returned to full consciousness, he explained that he had taken on the memories of an Armenian farmer who was burned alive by the Ottoman army in 1915 during the Armenian Genocide. During a different experiment, a man with Haitian ancestry touched the skull. Just before touching it, he complained of a chemical smell and a powerful itching sensation. After he touched it, he began to violently cough. His fugue state lasted for 60 minutes and was characterized by confusion and a sudden ability to speak Kurdish. After waking up from the fugue state, the man was able to describe the imprinted personality of an 85-year-old victim of a mustard gas attack in Iraq in 1989. A third experiment involved a woman with Chinese ancestry who became unresponsive for over two hours after touching the skull. She was clearly distressed and began to loudly weep as the time progressed. Once the two hours were up, she was able to give an interview where she described her experience while in the fugue state. She experienced the life of a young Ukrainian girl who died in 1932 as a result of violence at the hands of a Soviet brigade. Several other experiments were also conducted, producing similar results. Each time, the subject would experience a fugue state lasting from around an hour to upwards of six hours. The experiments allowed the Foundation to determine some statistical patterns in the personalities and memories experienced by test subjects. The more victims that can be attributed to a historical event, the more likely it is that a test subject will experience the memories of someone killed in that event. There is no apparent correlation between the nationality of the test subject and the nationality of the person whose memories they will live through. While there are no negative physical effects on test subjects who have come into contact with the skull, there is a notable psychological impact which can be attributed to the traumatic nature of the memories that they were exposed to during the course of the experiment. Subjects have demonstrated bouts of grief and depression, as well as struggles with survivor's guilt. Though they themselves did not survive the events that they witnessed, they feel as though they did. In an attempt to alleviate these psychological effects, the Foundation administered several types of amnestics to test subjects. However, these were not effective, and in many cases, they were actively harmful. The SCP Foundation uses a variety of amnestic compounds as a part of its work, but none of them were effective in treating test subjects who had been exposed to SCP-1123. Class B amnestics, or regressive retrograde, remove the most recently formed memories from a person's mind. When these were administered to SCP-1123 test subjects, their own memories began to fade away, while the memories of their imprinted personality remained intact. If the dosage was increased, only the memories of the atrocity would remain. Other amnestics with similar functions yielded similar and equally troubling results. The wrong memories would disappear, and the subject's original personality would begin to give way to that of the person the skull had imprinted on them. And so another type of amnestic was applied in an attempt to solve this issue. Class E amnestics, or ennui, do not remove memories from the subject's mind, but rather lessen the subject's emotional response to them. They are intended to weaken the neural pathways and remove the emotional component from a given memory, reducing the subject's stress or trauma response to the information of said memory. All of the science behind this class of amnestics suggests that it would be beneficial to the test subjects involved in this research, but for some reason, they were still ineffective. The application of Class E amnestics to test subjects following exposure to the atrocity skull only worsened the subject's trauma response, 
contributing to panic attacks, flashbacks, and other symptoms of severe post-traumatic stress disorder. Eventually, the use of amnestics to benefit these test subjects was abandoned entirely. Experimentation with the skull was placed on hold until a beneficial treatment program for the test subjects could be established. Currently, to preserve the condition of the skull and the writing on its surface, SCP-1123 is kept contained in a hermetically sealed container in an argon gas atmosphere. When it is removed from containment for experimentation and testing, it is kept in light at no more than 50 lux, with the temperature inside the container kept between 20 and 24 degrees Celsius and 55% humidity. No one is permitted to handle the skull under any circumstances except for controlled experimentation. There is a saying that says those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. As distressing as the experience of touching SCP-1123 may be, perhaps there is a use for it. Confronting historical atrocities directly and looking through the eyes of their victims is a stark reminder of all the evil that humanity is capable of. Certainly the history reflected by the atrocity skull, imprinted directly into the minds of all who touch it, will not be soon forgotten. Those who have touched it, those who speak to them, and all who learn about the impact of the atrocity skull should take care to remember history, to learn from it, to make sure that these evils are never repeated again. Perhaps we will even reach a point where we do not have to look through the eyes of the victims of institutionalized evil. We will simply have moved beyond it. Then and only then will it be time for the skull to be destroyed. Until then, it remains preserved in the halls of the SCP Foundation as a reminder that, amidst all the horrors contained in those walls, sometimes the greatest monster is us. For a moment, we want you to cast your mind back to your childhood, a time when you weren't as busy or burdened with the pressures of life that come as you grow up, when you were carefree and had your whole life ahead of you, nothing but potential and opportunity. A simpler time, when the highest award you could achieve wasn't a grade or a promotion, but something as simple as your mom or dad pinning a drawing you did to the door of the refrigerator. Oh, to be a kid again, right? Then again, maybe returning to younger days is better left as a fantasy. It's hard to imagine that something so pure, so simple and wholesome as a drawing on the fridge could ever be something dark, horrific even. But then you learn about SCP-683, and all of a sudden returning to your childhood becomes something you hope never happens. SCP-683 is an anomaly with various parts to it, so we'll start with SCP-683-1. At first glance, it looks to be just an ordinary refrigerator. To be more precise, it's actually a 1953 Crosley Shelvador. For any of you fridge experts out there who are curious about the exact make and model of SCP-683-1. For everyone else, picture the refrigerator that Indiana Jones hid inside to miraculously survive a nuclear blast in Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. That was such a plot device. I don't know about you guys, but I'm feeling nervous already. Like we said, at first glance you'd struggle to spot anything out of the ordinary about this particular fridge, apart from maybe some slight wear and tear on the outside. Inside though, it's perfectly clean, kept in perfect working condition for keeping food cool. But that's the first weird thing about SCP-683-1. You see, despite the Foundation conducting tests to deliberately make it messier, the fridge seems to have an inbuilt function that you wouldn't find in one from Home Depot. It can self-clean. Yes, that doesn't sound all that impressive, unless you're a fridge owner yourself and know what a nightmare they can be to keep clean. While it's definitely weird, it's not the last of SCP-683-1's anomalous properties. The next is the fact that the power cord of this refrigerator ends with a plug that doesn't match any known type of wall outlet. Seems even stranger. After all, who would design a fridge that can't even be plugged in, right? In fact, the SCP Foundation had to design their very own completely one-of-a-kind adapter to connect SCP-683-1 to an ordinary gas-powered home generator. Once plugged in though, SCP-683-1 functions exactly like you would expect any other refrigerator to. Mm, sort of. It's about time we move on to SCP-683's second component, designated as SCP-683-2. 
Again, much like the fridge it is somehow affixed to, at first look this part looks completely ordinary. It's a drawing, created using felt pens and pencils, presumably by a child between the ages of 5 and 7 years old. There's evidence of some moderate water damage to the paper, but once again nothing all that strange to look at. Even the subject of this child's drawing is pretty mundane. Just some scribbles of a pleasant mountainous landscape. A house, a well, a dog, a figure wearing a chef's took, and, of course, an anthropomorphic sun with a smiley face. Now sure, that might not sound all that impressive, but we would advise you not to say anything like that out loud. Criticizing the drawing is a comment you might wish you hadn't made. Just like when you fill our comment sections with dated Among Us memes. Seriously, it's getting old. Any person that makes any kind of negative or disparaging remark about the SCP-683-2 drawing or tries to remove the paper from the fridge door of SCP-683-1 will suffer a grim, horrific fate. The next time they try to eat anything, this person will suffer immense, irreparable damage to their internal organs, along with their skin and muscle tissue. This is intensely painful, causing the subject agonizing pain as their organs and skin are melted down. The amount the person loses is equal to the mass of food they've eaten. With each bite, they will lose more and more of their body. The painful process will not stop until they have ingested 0.42 kilograms of food, making this even worse. The process doesn't seem to target any organs that would kill the subject immediately. They're made to suffer in excruciating pain, punished with torture for daring to try and remove the drawing from the fridge. Any and all subjects will die within 26 days of taking that final bite and thus losing the last piece of themselves. But where do the body parts of these people go? Surely they don't disappear you must be thinking. And you would be right. In instances like this, the third mystery component of SCP-683 is revealed. Referred to as SCP-683-3, a brown paper lunch bag will manifest inside the SCP-683-1 fridge, containing a grim and grisly assortment of meals. On every occasion, the bag contains a sandwich with a pretty disgusting filling. The flesh and viscera of the last person who dared to criticize the drawing on the refrigerator. There is also a plastic Ziploc bag, in which you'll find the other half of the stolen organs and flesh of this unlucky person, along with three chocolate chip cookies. Surprisingly, these are actually completely normal cookies, with no traces of DNA or other abnormalities to them. Every time, there is also one final item that forms the contents of SCP-683-3, and that's a note, which reads, Be a good boy today. This note bears the same handwriting as appears on the outer surface of the paper bag, upon which a single name is written, Eric. Now, for those of you in the know about the various anomalies of the SCP Foundation, that particular unassuming name might sound very familiar. It was the same name mentioned by another anomaly, known as SCP-066. A brief bit of context for you. SCP-066 was a living ball of yarn that displayed friendly behavior towards Foundation staff. However, during an experiment, a thread was cut from SCP-066's body. This caused the yarn to transform into a ball of meat, with a pair of functional eyes protruding from it. SCP-066 became hostile, constantly asking for an Eric, whenever someone gets too close to it. The same name, Eric, was also found carved into the back of SCP-168, another anomaly encountered by the SCP Foundation. SCP-168 was an anomalous calculator, which actually possessed some level of sentience and had the ability to communicate. So who is Eric? Well, theories range far and wide, but there's no real definitive answer as to exactly who or what Eric might be. Some claim he's a reality-bending entity, others posit he's an SCP that the Foundation just doesn't know about yet. Regardless, he's connected to some intriguing entities, a sentient calculator, a formerly friendly ball of yarn, and a fridge with a child's drawing on it that can steal people's organs and put them in a lunch bag, especially for him. It would seem that Eric is a child, maybe a schoolboy, possibly even the one responsible for the drawing on SCP-683. This child could even potentially be anomalous in nature. Of course, this is all just rampant speculation on our part. 
so it's probably best to take all of that with a grain of salt. As we've said before, it is just a theory, an SCP explained theory. Eric might just remain one of the Foundation's many unanswered mysteries for years to come. But if that answer doesn't satisfy you, then why don't we go back to SCP-683? Maybe something in the fridge's origin will give us a further clue to the mystery of who Eric is. The fridge was first discovered by the SCP Foundation in the storage unit of a Washington home owned by a woman named Yolanda. As coincidence would have it, Yolanda was a collector of vintage home furnishings, including refrigerators, which would probably explain why she didn't think to throw out such an old model of fridge from the 1950s. According to her, she found SCP-683 simply left on a nearby street corner, with nobody around that could have left it there, or anyone that could have possibly been transporting it to the local dump. To give her a hand moving the fridge, Yolanda enlisted the help of her nephew, who agreed to step in and assist her in getting SCP-683 back to her house. Unfortunately though, the nephew passed away only two weeks later, apparently due to medical complications that came as the result of a hernia, according to his death certificate. Could Yolanda's nephew have been the mysterious and elusive Eric? Could something have happened to him after his death that allowed him to become some kind of anomaly? Who's to say? We can only guess and hope that one day we might get a full answer. As to why Yolanda never suffered the effects of SCP-683, she never actually tried to take the SCP-683-2 drawing down from the fridge. When asked why, she simply replied, It's a nice little picture, isn't it? Why take it down? Maybe, just maybe, it might have even reminded her of her nephew. It would have been a futile and foolish idea for Yolanda to have even tried to remove the drawing at any rate, as any who try will suffer that painful and horrifying process of losing their organs and having them appear in Eric's paper lunch bag. Even fire can't remove the drawing from the fridge, at least not permanently, suggesting that even the paper it is drawn on has its own anomalous properties. On three separate occasions, the SCP Foundation has attempted to test this, setting SCP-683-2 on fire with nothing more than a match. Every time, the drawing was incinerated, burning to ashes until there was nothing left. But within 68 hours, SCP-683-2 had returned to its permanent fixture on the fridge door, as if nothing had happened. Interestingly though, the D-Class members of personnel that were instructed to burn the drawing didn't suffer the usual anomalous effects of SCP-683. A similar thing happens if multiple people attempt to remove SCP-683-2 or say anything negative towards the drawing. In cases like this, only the very first person who made a disparaging remark or trying to rip the drawing from the fridge will be the one to suffer a long, painful torture by organ removal, followed swiftly by death. Now if you cast your mind back to earlier in the video, we told you that someone who tries removing or disparages SCP-683-2 will only suffer an anomalous lack of organs when they next eat something. So you must be thinking that the way to avoid that is to simply not eat, to fast, and not ingest a single meal. And yes, you'd be right. That does stave off the anomalous effects of the fridge and the drawing, but also means you're heading towards an even slower, painful death from starvation. To date, two different Foundation test subjects have died this way by refusing to eat after interacting with SCP-683. True, the SCP Foundation is most likely sitting on a whole cavalcade of different anomalies that can keep a person alive without the need for food, but you know what they're like, right? The Foundation's hardly likely to share the keys to surviving without having to eat. And there you have it, folks. That's SCP-683. Don't worry, it's highly unlikely that you'll ever encounter it. The Foundation keeps it under lock and key, in a cell fitted with a steel door and reinforced hinges. SCP-683 remains covered in a large cloth to prevent any members of personnel from looking at it when the fridge isn't being used for research or experiments. But you have to wonder, what if it's not the only fridge with these anomalous properties? After all, it's rare for a manufacturer to make just a single refrigerator of a certain model. Maybe you'd better be wary next time you visit someone with an older model of fridge in their kitchen. And just to be safe, if there is a drawing pin to the front door, leave it where it is.
Sometimes dealing with anomalies that could destroy the world with a flick of their wrist can get a little old. Sure, it definitely wouldn't be a good thing if the Devourer of Worlds, well, devoured the world, or if SCP-001 when day breaks turns us all into weird melty zombies, but it's almost impossible to conceive the sheer scale of destruction that an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario would cause. You'd almost be numb to it, if you even survived. In the words of SCP-2430 creator Joseph Stalin, the death of one man is a tragedy, the death of millions is a statistic. Okay, he didn't actually say that, but it's an appropriate quote either way. Today we're talking about a much smaller, pettier kind of evil. Sure, this anomaly can kill people, and has many, many times, in fact. But where it really gets its kicks is in making you feel like crap on a more emotional level. It's SCP-056, ironically known by the nickname, A Beautiful Person. Because on the inside, this self-obsessed monster is anything but beautiful. This crafty creature spent what potentially could have been hundreds of years around humans before the SCP Foundation eventually located it and apprehended it meaning you may have even run into it at some point or another before it was rightfully imprisoned. How do you know if you had a brush with SCP-056? Well, it's difficult to know for sure, but perhaps the biggest indicator is that it probably annoyed the living hell out of you. You see, SCP-056 is a sentient shapeshifter with a subtle mind-warping ability, whose entire reason for existence is using those abilities to make everyone around them feel incredibly inadequate. They don't have any kind of consistent or true form, only a consistent ethos, and that ethos is anything you can do. I can do better. And we mean this in the most literal sense. Whenever SCP-056 is left with a person, an animal, or even an object, the second all eyes are taken off of it, it'll become a slightly better version of whatever it's encountering. If that thing in question is capable of thinking or feeling, it will not feel good about this development. Just like we said, it's probably not going to bring the world to its knees, but it sure would suck to know SCP-056. Its lack of a consistent form makes SCP-056 a little difficult to think about visually, which was also the reason it was so hard to catch. But for the sake of consistency, we'll present it here with one of its favorite forms, a woman who's a real dead ringer for perfection, famous actress Scarlett Johansson of Black Widow fame. Personally, I liked her as the computer in her, but that's besides the point. So what is it really like to experience SCP-056's anomalous effects firsthand? Well, we'll take you through a little crash course in anomalous insecurity and frustration. Let's say that this creature, in human form, is one of your co-workers. When the Foundation discovered it, it was working in the fashion industry. But who knows what job it could have held before then. If it worked in your office, it was probably that one irritating co-worker who always wore nicer clothes than you, had a brighter, wider smile, and much better hair. While you were thanklessly toiling away on the reports for the latest financial quarter, 056 was schmoozing with your boss on golf lunches, scoring perfect games and promotions one hole-in-one at a time. Of course, they'll tell you about it at the water cooler. Like everyone else who's feeling inadequate, maybe you buy yourself a new car. A vintage Cadillac convertible that makes you feel more like a gangster than an office drone. Awesome. That'll make all those feelings that you're not good enough go away. You even buy yourself a stylish pair of sunglasses and start cruising around town with the top down, hoping that everyone sees how cool you are now. But when you are stopped at a red light, you see someone approaching in the lane next to you. It's the latest Rolls-Royce Phantom in jet black. And who would be behind the wheel but SCP-056 in Armani shades that are much nicer than yours. It grins and nods to you in the mirrors, and you can feel your soul shriveling up inside you, only to be replaced by rage and resentment. Maybe later that month, you and all your coworkers are at a bar, enjoying drinks. Of course, SCP-056 is the best dressed one there, and is telling all the most interesting stories. Your jokes don't get any laughs, but 056 is bringing down the house with every word. Feeling ignored, you decide to get everyone around on you. 056 is a designated driver in its new Rolls Royce, so you just decide to get them a Pepsi instead. However, by the time you return to their stool, they're nowhere to be seen. A tall glass of Coca-Cola with ice cubes is sitting on the bar next to their seat. Perhaps one day you finally snap and decide you can't take it anymore. You'll meet SCP-056 after work and put the showboating jerk in its place at long last. 
You sneak up on it in an alley with a knife in your palm and swing for it, but your blade never makes contact. SCP-056 unleashes some high-level jujitsu move on you, easily knocks the knife from your hands and beats the living hell out of you. When you're later convicted of attempted murder, all you can do is scream, they made me do it, again and again, in your prison cell. Envy can do crazy things to a person. But wait, there's more. Really, if you lose your mind from an encounter with SCP-056, you still haven't done too badly. While its methods of attack are more commonly psychological, as we alluded to earlier, SCP-056 is definitely not above committing some pretty horrifying acts of violence. SCP-056 was discovered in its clothing design job after causing an unusually high number of murders, suicides, and mental breakdowns among its co-workers. However, things took an even more unpleasant turn when the Foundation sent personnel to detain it. SCP-056 reacted poorly to the show of potential force and turned into something even more dangerous than the Foundation planned for it in getting under control. We don't know exactly what it transformed into due to SCP Foundation redactions, but our guesses for what it transformed into would either be a giant monster, a Rambo-esque unstoppable super soldier, or something like one of those huge killer robots from Robocop. Pick your favorite down there in the comments. But whatever the case, it caused the unfortunate deaths of 17 agents and 10 civilians. The incident was blamed on an employee at the company going postal and deciding to kill a bunch of innocents, which technically wasn't untrue. Hmm. Not long after, Foundation operatives were able to tranquilize SCP-056. Perhaps you think this nasty little monster decided to mellow out a bit after being contained. But if you did think that, I'm afraid you'd be dead wrong. It just decided to start terrorizing Foundation staff with its infuriating anomalous abilities instead. Wait until you see this. Compared to a lot of entities locked up at the SCP Foundation, SCP-056 really lives in the lap of luxury. It has a well-furnished room, easy access to members of staff, and is given permission to interact with any object it desires as long as those objects aren't anomalous. Why is this Euclid-class anomaly with over 17 dead Foundation staff members to its name given so much leeway? Well, to answer that, remember the ethos, anything you can do, I can do better. And this holds true, whether we're talking about physical appearance or one's capacity to commit tremendous acts of violence. The Foundation is forced to cater to most of SCP-056's whims, or it will become a hell of a lot more dangerous in response to any kind of external resistance. See? We told you it'd suck to have known this thing. And nobody knows that better than the employees of the SCP Foundation who are forced to interact with it on a daily basis for containment and testing. First, let's take a look at some of the forms it's occupied since it began its time at the SCP Foundation. When a researcher brought in their beloved pooch, SCP-056 decided to flex on it by becoming a beautiful, well-groomed Labrador Retriever. When a younger female staff passed it, it decided to once again take on its Scarlett Johansson form. When speaking to a group of other researchers about intelligence, it became a female researcher with an IQ score 30 points higher than the top-scoring human researcher on site. When it took a trip to the containment site's gym, where the guards and mobile task forces exercise and train, it decided to take its flexes to a more literal level. It transformed into a ripped, hunky bodybuilder, who strutted into the middle of the gym and bench pressed 250 kilos no problem. This was 30 kilos more than the strongest human guard working at the site. Its commitment to being the best is so great that when left alone in its containment chamber, it will sometimes literally transform into a nicer couch than the one the Foundation provided for it. Doesn't it just make your blood boil? But wait, there's more. Just in case this wasn't absurd enough, the Foundation felt like testing the limits of its anomalous abilities. In particular, they were extremely eager to see if 056 had a secret default form. They left it alone with a single security camera in order to observe what it transformed into when not being observed. And can you guess what happened? It turned into an even higher quality security camera and stared back. While the transformations can only take place while 056 isn't being observed, it's very astute at creating periods where it can't be seen or interacted with. Vision or camera feeds have been known to briefly go foggy in order to facilitate a transformation. It's fitting that 056, being the ultimate diva, will only ever let people look at it on its own terms. It also seems to get off on causing shame, and the degree to which that statement is metaphorical is, well, open to interpretation. 
Staff members made insecure by its antics feel compelled to enter its cell and verbally berate it, at which point 056 will shame them even harder and send them out with their tail between their legs. It's like every toxic friend rolled into one nasty package. Curious as to what else SCP-056 was capable of, the Foundation conducted a few other tests between SCP-056 and their personnel. Here, they discovered that 056 seemed incredibly responsive to intent. When a D-Class was sent in with a knife and the intent to kill, 056 transformed into a lean, athletic man before disarming and killing the D-Class. A somewhat attractive D-Class female was sent in with a bottle of wine. 056 became a beautiful woman and accepted the wine, before taking a sip and spitting it back into the D-Class's face. A mixed-gender pair of D-Classes were sent in next with no real intent. 056 became an attractive woman in a well-tailored business suit, who looked over the pair before kicking them both out. Ten male D-Classes were sent in after that. 056 turned into a beautiful woman in a low-cut dress and simply waited until the ten men were driven mad with desire and began physically fighting one another for her affection. She watched them doing this for seven minutes before laughing and leaving the simp squadron to duke it out alone. In another test, a female staff member with level 4 clearance, who was also judged to be the most attractive woman on site, which seems like an HR issue that the Ethics Committee should probably look into, was sent into 056's testing chamber. 056 became, quote, an extremely aesthetically pleasing woman, who displayed a large lexicon and understanding of management skills, unquote. The two spoke for around 90 minutes until the level 4 staff member stormed out in a rage. Recently, 056 has requested access to the internet, saying that the Foundation has been unable to provide it with enough syncopants, and that via the internet the whole world will be able to see its face. If ever 056 got onto YouTube and transformed into a more successful SCP channel, I just don't think we'd be able to take it. Thankfully, this request was denied. Legends about the end of the world often come with the sounds of thundering hooves and the approach of four horsemen. War. Famine, pestilence, death. They will descend on the world and usher in the end of days. It's a terrifying idea, these horsemen bringing darkness and decay wherever they go, as the world collapses all around them. We all hope that we'll never see the day that the four horsemen come. Unfortunately, some lucky people out there have already encountered their own version of the horsemen of the apocalypse. Shadowy riders with inhuman strength that follow disaster, destruction, and untold suffering. The SCP Foundation came across a series of journal entries written by Dave Harkin, an infantryman in the British Expeditionary Force during World War I. That first world war was a nightmare for all who fought in it. A sea of bloodshed and gunfire. Young men crouched terrified in foxholes and wondering when death would finally come for them. The horrors of war are notable, but not exactly the sort of thing the SCP Foundation preoccupies itself with. So what was so captivating, so specifically terrible, about Dave Harkin's journals? They described his experiences over the course of the Battle of the Somme, and an anomaly he encountered there that was unlike anything he had ever seen. No military training, no combat experience could have prepared him for what was waiting, hiding in the fog of war. His first journal entry began on a lighthearted note, or as lighthearted as one can be in the face of combat. June 27th, 1916. Finally arrived at the front. I picked up this little journal while I was in Paris. Figured I might as well keep record of my heroics on the battlefield. Quite chuffed to finally be in action, though it seems I'm the only one. Most of these blokes have been fighting for a couple months now, and they look downright dreadful. Mud all over the uniform and their faces are so pale, look like they haven't eaten or slept for months. A few days later, he began to hear stirrings amongst his fellow soldiers, and strange sounds that rocked their barracks. He described the first unsettling incident. July 2nd, 1916. Woke in the early hours of the morning. Ground was shaking. Damn near shook me out into the muck on the dugout floor. Poor blokes in the bunks on the other side looked like they had seen a ghoul. A pair of Northern Irish lads from Kitchener's armies, if I remember right, kept muttering about a nuckety, were both gripping a gold crucifix. I was about to lay my head back down and get a wink of shut-eye when I ended up scrambling into the mud. Loudest damn thing I'd ever heard. Thought it was the Hun artillery about to mark us with a whiz-bang. Only problem was, never did get the bang. This morning asked our brass hat about the artillery barrage. Gave me a funny look. 
and asked what the bloody hell I was talking about. The next day, Dave went searching for the source of the loud sound. He didn't find any evidence of artillery, but instead found something he had never seen before. It was a crater, shaped like a giant horse's hoof. He brushed it off as just another oddity of the battlefield. A bit strange, but nothing to be concerned about. There were more important things at hand, anyway. The next day, he finally saw combat firsthand, and things only got more bizarre and frightening. July 3rd, 1916. Huns made a push today. First time they've moved into our region. First time I'd ever seen combat. It's not romantic and adventurous. It's terrifying and deadly. My hands can't stop shaking. Already messed up the chit once. The Huns had our outfit up against the wall. Damn near overran us. Didn't help that it rained that night before making our foxhole filled to the brim with muck. One of the Fritz came right at me and just... I put one right between his eyes. Fell right at the edge of the trench. I had to look at him in the eyes. Poor lad couldn't have been more than 17 or 18. Martin, one of the Irish lads, is gone. Was unlike anything I'd ever seen. One moment he's standing shooting at Huns, all of a sudden the mud starts boiling. Before anyone can react, mud just flies everywhere. Everyone else is suddenly knocked down off their feet. I look up, and he's just gone. Wasn't even body parts left. Haven't told anyone, but I'd swear that there were bones coming from underneath him right before the mud went flying. His mate, Brendan, was digging in the mud for hours looking for the crucifix. Martin's body was never found, no matter how they searched. A little over a week later, things got even worse. July 14th and 15th, 1916. Huns tried to push this morning in the rain. I was in the machine gun nest with Brendan, the other Irish chap in my unit. They kept coming and coming and getting stuck in the mud, and I just kept shooting. Sun is rising. I'm on watch till at least eight. At least that's what the brass hat said. I've started losing track of how much time's been passing. There's something out there. Something lurking out in the mud and dead Huns. Nearly dozed off last night listening to the moans of the blighty wounded stuck out in no man's land. Poor souls got left behind. Saw something out of the edge of my vision. Something big. Couldn't quite make it out. It was much darker than usual. Overcast sky was obscuring the full moon. Heard a couple of screams, but whatever it was, was gone before my flare hit the sky. This would not be Dave's last sighting of the large, dark figure. This mysterious shadow would appear again several days later, and there would be more of them. July 30th, 1916. I've been seeing them at the edge of my vision ever since that first night. They're huge. They move so damn fast that they're gone before I can get a clear look. Or at least that's how it was mucking out until today. Thick fog and mist rolled in this morning. Blanketed everything. We figured the Huns might use it to launch another push. Bastards have been pushing non-stop since the 20th. Saw it. Through the fog. Looked like a shadow hiding in the mist. Some sort of horse-like creature with something dragging along the ground and a giant lump where the rider would sit, said the lump started moving. Could have sworn it was a person or something that looked like a person. Sat up, and the things dragging along the ground reached out in front of it and picked up something. Thought it was a couple dead jerrys, until they started squirming. I'll never forget the noise it made, louder than a banshee, shrill and twisted. It looked right at me, two pairs of red glowing orbs. Two weeks after meeting eyes with this chilling apparition, Dave wrote a short note in his journal. August 5th, Brennan calls them knucklaves. Won't tell me much more than that. Beginning to understand why all these blokes look so terrified when I first arrived. It wasn't until another week passed that Dave would truly begin to understand just what kind of monster he was up against. Not the enemy soldiers, but something far more horrible. Something inhuman. August 13th. Bloody hell, the nightmares. Been on watch two nights in a row. One just appeared right there, right in front of me. 20 feet had to be at least 20 feet away. Towering into the sky. Got my flare to go off in time just to see it pick up a couple wounded jerrys in the mud. They don't have bloody skin. They're just muscle and fat. The thing on its back wasn't human. No way it could be human. Had no skin either. No legs, just merged straight into the horse at the stomach. I took a couple shots at it with my rifle. Did absolutely nothing. Like I was shooting it with a slingshot. It stopped as my flare reached its highest point and turned. Looked straight down at me. Both the horse and the thing on its back. It smiled. He tried to warn his superiors. Tried to warn of the horrors he was seeing and the danger he felt they posed. But they wouldn't listen. Night after night, the creatures came back. August 17th, 1916. Been assigned night watch the past four nights straight. Tried to tell the brass hat about the knucklives. Didn't believe me. 
said it was this shell shock playing with my head. Had to put a sock in it and keep on. It keeps coming back. Every night. Same spot 20 feet in front of me. Picks up wounded Jerry's, turns and looks, and then it's gone. He plays with me. I'm sure of it. Last night there was another one too. Four of those things on its back did the same damn thing. A few days later, Dave spotted something that made his blood run cold. 7 a.m. August 20th, 1916. Jerry's made a big push yesterday. Rain two days ago, all day, so the muck was deep. We were on the machine gun again in the pillbox. So many of them in no man's land last night. Couldn't tell the dead from the living. Haven't slept in six days. There were five tonight. Three of them had more than one of those things on their back. The one that keeps coming back dropped something. Saw it shine in the flare light. 10 a.m. August 20th, 1916. Went out into the mud where it appears every night. Found Martin's crucifix and tin hat. Whatever this thing was, it had taken Martin. It seemed to want Dave to know that too. It left behind Martin's lost things for him to find. As if it was gloating. As if it already knew that it had won. August 20th, 1916. The getting bold. Saw one out in broad daylight. Pretty sure it was the same one. Buried itself in the mud. Just lying there. Waiting. We're going over the top at three. There are more out there now. All doing the same thing. God help us. Dave Harkland was declared missing in action on August 20th, 1916. Following an attempted counterattack against the German forces. Another soldier from his unit, Brendan O'Malley, was also reported missing in action on the same day. Though Dave's body was never recovered, his journal was found 20 feet away from the edge of the German trenches two months later. Poor Dave Harkin had no idea what he and the rest of his fellow soldiers encountered out there. He didn't live to learn more, but he came face to face with SCP-3456. SCP-3456 is not one being, but rather a group of quadrupeds that vaguely resemble horses. From a distance, their silhouette looks like that of a horse with a human riding on its back. However, once the observer gets closer, they will notice some disturbing differences. These creatures do not look like any ordinary horse. They are smooth and hairless, with translucent skin and three-toed hooves. Anyone unfortunate enough to get close to one of these creatures will be able to see through their skin to the blood vessels and muscle underneath. They will also notice that there is no rider perched atop the creature's back at all. The humanoid shape is part of the creature's body, an extension of them fused to its back. The humanoid figure consists of a pair of long arms, which drags along the ground as the creature moves, and a head. The arms end in sharpened bones rather than fingers, and the head has mostly human features, with the exception of a hole where the nose should be. The creatures vary greatly in size, with the largest on record measuring at a height of 30 meters and a width of 15. They appear to be invulnerable, at least when it comes to any traditional human weaponry they have currently been exposed to. Gunfire, explosives, swords and arrows, and even nuclear blasts seem to have no effect. If you happen to get a good look at one of these bulletproof abominations in person, then I am so sorry. You are as good as gone. Because once you have seen one of these creatures, they have also seen you. And they will not stop until they have taken you. They will track you, stalk you, hide buried in mud and nestled in bushes. They will wait for the opportune moment, and they will reach out with their unnaturally long arms smiling with no lips as their blood-red eyes burn like hellfire, and you will disappear forever. They will travel far beyond the site where they first appeared, until they have finally captured their prey. This isn't an SCP-096 situation either. They aren't punishing you for seeing their face. They want to be seen and will go out of their way to show themselves to people until they have captured as many as they want. No one knows what becomes of SCP-3456's victims, but they are never seen again. Though items once belonging to the missing people may resurface, their bodies are never found. There is only one way to escape from SCP-3456, and that is to find and cross a body of fresh water. For reasons unknown, the entities are unable or unwilling to cross rivers, streams, and lakes. The Foundation first discovered this during an operation in Iraq, in which several agents encountered a group of SCP-3456 manifestations. They fled from the monsters and quickly retreated across the Tigris River. Once they had reached the other side, they saw that the creatures had not followed them onto the bridge. Instead, they remained at the riverbank on the other side, watching and waiting. This was quickly noted. 
and added to potential containment procedures, though the exact reason for SCP-3456's dislike of fresh water is currently unknown. In Dave Harkland's journals, his fellow soldier described the creatures as knucklaves, but would not elaborate beyond that. So what is a knucklave? The word refers to a creature from the waters of Orkney, a group of islands on the northern coast of Scotland. Their name is thought to come from an Orsidian word meaning devil of the sea, and they truly are like something out of hell. These creatures are native to the ocean and supposedly take on another form when in their natural habitat, but no one knows what they truly look like. On land, the creature is a hybrid of a man and horse, with a large snout like that of a pig, and a single red eye that burns like the embers of a fire. It has no hair or skin, just raw tissue and bone-dripping black blood. Everything about the creature is malicious and deadly, intended to bring harm and calamity to humans. Even its breath is toxic, thought to cause disease, plague, and the death of crops. As they are native to the ocean, they detest fresh water and will not cross it even in pursuit of their prey. They will also not appear when it is raining. In the legends of the Nuklev, they do have a natural enemy. A creature from Orcadian folklore known as the Mither of the Sea is said to have the power to keep the monsters from coming ashore during the summer months. The Mither, or Mother, is a benevolent force of nature, giving warmth to the oceans and life to the beings on the water and the land. Though SCP-3456 has appeared during the summer months, it has never been spotted in the Orkney region during this time of year. Perhaps this is a coincidence, but some Foundation researchers have proposed a research expedition to the area in order to look for the kindly ocean spirit. So far, this proposal has been denied. SCP-3456 is classified as Keter, and there is currently no way to effectively contain it. All previous attempts to contain or to neutralize the horsemen have failed, though the Foundation is always looking for new methods to attempt. Currently, any personnel who see the horsemen will be given Class G amnestics at a treatment center located within one kilometer of a freshwater stream, river, or lake. All references to the horsemen have been scrubbed from historical records, and any sightings are to be blamed on PTSD, shock, and trauma-induced hysteria. Areas that are likely to attract SCP-3456, such as war zones and areas impacted by natural disasters, are to be heavily monitored by the Foundation. In the event of a disaster, Foundation personnel will be sent to help with evacuation in order to get all civilians away from SCP-3456 as quickly as possible. So what is SCP-3456? Is it the dreaded knuckleg from folk tales and whispered fireside warnings? There are some notable differences between the stories and what the Foundation encountered. SCP-3456 does not seem to have come from the ocean, nor is it limited to only appearing around Orkney. These beasts seem to manifest from thin air, and disappear the same way when their nasty work is done. But folklore and passing down stories often distorts things. Details change, and others are added or left out. In the original stories, the Nuklev were thought to be the cause of famines, plagues, and disasters. Perhaps it was simply drawn to these events, lured there by the scent of pure human misery. Perhaps the Nuklev is not just similar to SCP-3456, but the two are one and the same, or perhaps they are something entirely different. Whatever the case may be, there is nothing we can do to stop them. War, famine, pestilence, and death are everywhere. They are inevitable and unfortunate parts of life on Earth. So it seems are these deadly riders, these monsters that are neither horse nor man, but still somehow both. Every time we wage war, every time disaster strikes, they will come to watch, to pick through the rubble, and to smile. Maybe we don't need to dread the coming of the Horsemen of the Apocalypse. They are already here. There are many things in this world that we do not, and perhaps cannot, understand. The SCP Foundation dedicates itself to researching and containing these things. But even they occasionally encounter something that defies any kind of true understanding. The unknown is terrifying to the average person, but for an organization that specializes in knowing the unknowable, a mystery that refuses to be understood can be downright nightmarish. A Foundation expedition team lost contact with their command while on a mission in the northern Ural Mountains of Russia. After six hours of silence, radio contact was re-established, though video feed continued to be disabled. 
A lone agent, Dr. Fellenstein, called out desperately over the radio waves, begging for someone, anyone, to answer him. Command responded, requesting a status update on the rest of his crew. At first, they were met only with the wet, hollow sound of Fellenstein weeping. Finally, he explained that they were all dead, and that he was the only man left standing. <laughs> Something got to him, he said of fellow Agent Myers. It was long, slippery. I saw a grown man pulled into a tiny hole. He began to hyperventilate, his descriptions becoming less and less coherent. Command offered to send reinforcements to collect the survivor, but he begged them not to. He was beyond saving at this point, describing himself as nothing but a walking corpse. After slipping into a crevice, Fallenstein had broken his ankle and torn a hole in his hazmat suit. Command honored his insistence that no reinforcements be sent in, but encouraged him to try and pull himself back to the surface and retrieve additional data. Even if he was doomed, he could still provide valuable information on the threat he encountered. While Felenstein attempted to free himself from the crevice, he slipped deeper into the crack in the ground. Pushing through his fear of being crushed to death, he tried again. Fighting against the burning of the toxic air in his lungs and the straining of his muscles, he finally pulled himself to freedom. Then he took in his surroundings. He was at the edge of a chasm, so deep he could not see the bottom. He posited that he was somewhere underneath or inside of a mountain. There was a putrid smell in the air, burning his eyes, his skin, everything. Command told him to remain calm, still hoping for the possibility of a rescue. Meanwhile, on their end, hostile forces were closing in and forcing them to evacuate. They asked Fallenstein to continue describing his surroundings so that his account might be recorded for the archives. They would attempt to come back with reinforcements when it was safe for them to do so. As Fellenstein made it deeper into the chasm, he was engulfed in a thick yellow fog. Through the haze, he could make out thousands of eggs and piles of meat being devoured by small creatures with the bodies of grubs and the faces of human infants. The creatures did not respond to his presence, either unaware of him or too consumed with their feeding to care. As he passed the creatures, he spotted a massive black temple with architecture like nothing he had seen before all polished and sharp with angles that hurt his eyes to look at. As he stopped to take a better look, he realized he was still moving somehow, without moving his feet. He was being dragged by something, tendrils wrapped around his legs and pulling him along against his will, leaving a trail of his blood behind. As he was dragged, dozens of what seemed like humans watched him. The final words recorded on the audio transcript were the most troubling of all. Fallenstein saw what he described as an angel with a thousand wings. The angel pulled him into her embrace, clutching him to her breast, and the connection was lost. Dr. Fallenstein was never seen again. His colleagues' bodies were never recovered. The entire team of men was lost forever, inside the incomprehensible hellhole known as SCP-2133. SCP-2133 is an unnamed village in the northern Ural Mountains in Eastern Europe with an estimated population of around 50 people. The village is considered dangerous to enter without proper hazmat gear, due to the presence of a wide variety of microbial pathogens within its limits, including those which cause leprosy, pneumonic, septemic, and bubonic plagues, typhoid fever, influenza, cholera, and smallpox, a veritable hypochondriac's worst nightmare. In spite of this cocktail of diseases in which they live, the residents of 2133 seem to be resistant to the negative effects of infection. Of course, they experience physical symptoms to the point of visible disfigurement or disability, but they do not die at a rate consistent with the sheer volume of deadly pathogens present in their town. The people of SCP-2133 do not leave it. The Foundation cannot fully determine whether they cannot leave or simply choose not to, but whatever the case may be, they stay within the limits of their village. Their relative resistance to disease, small population, and refusal to leave the boundaries of their village are all unusual. But that is far from the most unusual thing about the population of SCP-2133. The people of the village age and die, yes, but they do not stay dead. They engage in what can only be described as some kind of reincarnation. When a resident of the village dies, they are placed in the field, where they quickly decay. On the night of the first new moon, a newborn infant is pulled from the soil where the decaying body once lay. The reborn version of each person looks like their previous self and carries all of the memories they had in their previous life. 
The Foundation performed extensive soil tests on the field where this curious rebirth takes place, and found that the soil there contains high levels of embryonic fluid. Beyond the presence of this fluid in the Earth, it is unknown how exactly this reincarnation process works. The residents of the village, known as SCP-2133-1, speak an old Russian dialect and occasionally agree to be interviewed by Foundation staff fluent in this dialect. Though they will sit for interviews and chat with Foundation personnel, they are secretive about their lives, their history, and the culture of their little village. The first resident to be successfully interviewed was an elderly man named Aristika, who was missing his left arm and had necrosis on most of his visible skin. The interview was conducted by Dr. Judith Lowe, one of the head researchers on the case. She asked the man how far back he was able to remember, and he recounted a time of czars and cons. When Dr. Lowe pressed the man about the rebirth that his people practice, he responded that it was the Church of the Red Harvest. We serve until the end. That is the terms of our agreement. Dr. Lowe asked him why he and the rest of his people would continue to live their lives this way when it caused them such obvious suffering. He explained simply, there is no choice. The land calls, we answer. She continued to push the issue, inquiring about how this all began so many years ago. He explained that a priestess came to the valley many lifetimes ago. She offered the people paradise in exchange for their servitude. However, as the years passed, the people became more and more exhausted. They feared they had failed somehow and were being punished. Aristokoff became visibly upset at this point in the interview, but continued to insist, the Church of the Red Harvest is truth. There is no other. The second interview was conducted again by Dr. Judith Lowe, who spoke with Anya, a young girl who appeared to be between the ages of six and eight. Lowe greeted the girl and attempted to ask her the first question, but Anya simply said, you don't belong here, leave. Lowe brushed this off and offered the girl medical assistance, but was rebuffed again. You are not of the Covenant. You will never understand. Dr. Lowe asked Anya to elaborate on the nature of this Covenant, and her explanation was similar to that of the previous interviewee. There was an agreement made a long time ago, and now the people of the village would serve until the end of time. Again, she insisted that the Foundation should leave and did not belong in the town. Finally irritated with the questions, Anya had only this to say about the church. The church was here long before the village. A church of stone beneath the earth. It is sacred. A church of wood was built atop it for the hearsay of the cross before we embrace the true faith. The Karsist Alka will enlighten you. You are only alive because she has chosen to let you live. Hearing the word Karsis probably gives you some indication as to what's really going on here. If the disease, corruption, and mutation of the flesh didn't give you enough of a clue, this horror is sarkic through and through. Dr. Lowe's final question was a seemingly easy one. Does the village have a name? As soon as the words left Dr. Lowe's lips, Anya began to vomit up a thick black substance, ending the interview. Instances of SCP-2133-1 are largely apathetic towards Foundation agents, unless they get in the way of their routine. The agents are allowed to go inside any of the buildings in the village, with one notable exception, the Church of the Red Harvest. Any attempts to learn more about the church or enter its walls are met with refusal to explain, or in some cases, outright hostility. Though the villagers are largely peaceful toward the Foundation, they are not the only entity living in SCP-2133. Throughout the village, there are instances of something known as SCP-2133-2. These organic structures, which have the appearance of dark red tentacles, display overt hostility towards outsiders and will attack any that get too close. They are especially aggressive to any outsiders that attempt to enter the church. Tissue samples were taken from the tentacles for observation, and they were found, horrifyingly enough, to genetically resemble tissue samples from humans. After the interview with Anya, the Foundation research team determined that entering the church was of the utmost importance. Mobile Task Force Beta-7 was dispatched for this mission, and after the residents of the town were restrained, a team of 12 operatives was sent in. They were armed with radios, video recorders, hazmat suits, and air tanks. As they attempted to enter the church, the tentacles attacked, but were subdued with flamethrowers. Apparently, like most living things, they are not immune to fire. Inside the church, the research team found small idols crafted from bone and leather, and a few others made from tumors hanging from iron hooks on the ceiling. 
At the building center was an entrance to a system of caves and caverns beneath the village, stretching beyond its borders into the mountains. Several previously unseen organisms, designated only as SCP-2133-3, were discovered inside. One was terminated and taken back to the Foundation for an autopsy. The creature was humanoid in nature, with swollen organs and flesh, and an overgrowth of bone and fatty tissue. After the autopsy, the team of operatives refreshed their air tanks and headed back into the village to continue their research. About 50 minutes into their expedition, all contact was lost out of nowhere. Six hours later, Dr. Fellenstein would make his infamous radio contact, and the nightmare would unfold from there. Currently, SCP-2133 is easily contained. A secure perimeter is maintained at the 10-kilometer radius around the town, preventing any civilians from making their way inside. There are guards positioned along the perimeter under the guise of a Russian military base. In spite of the horrifying nature of SCP-2133, the villagers do not seem to pose an immediate threat to anyone. They simply want to be left alone, to till the fields and attend their church, in an endless cycle of winters and summers as they wait for the end to come, as they hope that finally their agreement will be honored and that they will find peace. The ocean is a terrifying place. We've all heard the statistics. More than 80% of the ocean remains unexplored. That's most of the water covering the globe, completely unmapped and unobserved by science. It's a scary thought to dwell on, realizing that there's more water than land on Earth, and the sheer expanse of that water is so large that we've been unable to fully explore all of it. Just think, there are places in the ocean that have never been seen by a human. Who knows what's down there? If there was ever a personification of fear of the unknown, the ocean could definitely be it. Ancient shipwrecks sunk to the ocean floor, unknown sea creatures hiding away from humanity, and the general isolation of the suffocating dark blue the ocean swallows its victims with. All of these images that come to mind when thinking about the vast and mysterious depths of the sea. And no one is more familiar with nautical mysteries than the SCP Foundation. Today, we'll be taking a look at SCP-5007, the Bass Strait, a wave of oceanic anomalies fit to make any seasoned sailor shiver in fear. The Bass Strait is an area of ocean dividing Tasmania and the Australian mainland. It's also the location of an unusually high amount of disappearances, sailors disappearing from their ships, fishermen leaving in the night and never coming back, even civilians disappearing from the shores that connect to the strait. The Foundation was aware of these disappearances since 1858, but were only able to craft theories about what was causing them. Was it an anomalous group of interest? Hostile aerial entities patrolling the skies above the strait? Phenomenon associated with unidentified flying objects? What about subterranean anomalies, weather patterns, or time dilation? For nearly a century, the Foundation was unable to determine the cause of the high number of disappearances in the Bass Strait. And then, the phenomenon suddenly revealed itself. In 1980, on a beach connected to the Strait, Agent Taberner, an operative of the SCP Foundation, was vacationing with his wife Mary and his three young children. The Taberner family was simply enjoying their day, when they saw what looked like balloons in the sky. They were approaching quickly, and naturally the family moved closer. What happened next was a whirlwind, and those balloons the family were so interested in lifted them up from the ground and carried them away. Agent Taberner tried to fight back, but there was nothing he could do, except report to the Foundation what had occurred, and the organization responded in full force. The Foundation's research discovered that reports of UFOs and lights in the sky had coincided with many disappearances in the strait, and that this was a pattern. The search for the four lost Taberner family members had become a large-scale investigation into unexplained disappearances along the Bass Strait, and within three weeks, it was determined that these patterns were consistent across the entirety of the strait's coastal regions. Some witnesses were interviewed, but the vast majority of these abduction cases had no witnesses whatsoever. Of the minimal reports filed, the Foundation was told that there were lights in the sky, and that appearance of unidentified flying objects described as having the appearances of balloons. One such witness interviewed was a man by the name of Alan Stewart, a witness who was present during the disappearance of former Australian Prime Minister Harold Holt, whose disappearance the Foundation believed may have had a connection to the Bass Strait anomalies. During the interview, Stewart claimed that Holt and his family, while voyaging on their yacht, 
decided to leave the boat and go for a swim. Holt turned to Stuart and asked him if he could see the balloons around the cliff. Stuart had no idea what Holt was talking about, but Holt was insistent on seeing them. He swam deeper out into the ocean, saying that they weren't normal balloons and that there was someone inside of them. Stuart and Holt's family called out for him to come to shore, but he wouldn't listen. Stuart tried to rationalize what he saw next. Maybe it was the current sweeping Holt away, but he couldn't lie to the Foundation interviewer. Mm -hmm. Stuart saw Holt go further and further out into the water, and suddenly the Prime Minister turned around. He began swimming in the opposite direction, and he was screaming. Suddenly, Holt was lifted from the sea and pulled into the air by something emerging from the clouds. The Foundation thanked Stuart for the interview and continued their investigation. Two years later, in 1982, Emergency services received a large number of calls pertaining to UFO sightings off the coast of Norman Bay, Victoria. The Foundation was quick to respond, alerting task forces and local sites to prepare for an investigation. Upon arriving to the scene, they confirmed the existence of multiple entities that would later be documented as SCP-5007. They evacuated civilians from the area and successfully managed to capture the creature, which was later transported to Site-40 for containment. It was a sight to behold. The entity, now designated SCP-5007-S1, was a cluster of human bodies fused between a grouping of black tentacles of varying length. Each tentacle was fused to the skin it touched directly. The stomachs of the corpses were grossly swollen and distorted to massive sizes to hold large quantities of gases inside, the buoyancy of which the entity used to achieve a passive flight. Across the entity's surface were clusters of eyes and bioluminescent glowing organs. Many of the humanoid components of the corpses appeared to have been removed and misplaced across various parts of the entity's body. What's more is that the Foundation discovered that human portions of SCP-5007 appeared somewhat cognizant and aware of their situation. Their vocalizations were incoherent and barely understandable, consisting of gasping and whimpering, but the corpses were observed to implore other individuals to approach them when encountered. SCP-5007's behavior during abduction scenarios was documented during the initial containment event, and due to the Foundation's painstaking research, a pattern was established between all SCP-5007 encounters. First, the victim would be alone, or otherwise vulnerable, in a coastal location. SCP-5007 haven't shown a preference for weather, be they clear or hostile skies, but they have localized all of their activity to the Bass Strait in small coastal towns, beaches, or boats. SCP-5007 will then move towards the shore, stalking the victim before lowering its tentacles and appendages to grab the individual, snatching them into the sky. An SCP-5007 instance can even abduct multiple people at once. One event observed had eight men from the decks of a commercial fishing boat taken into the sky in under 15 seconds. Once captured, SCP-5007 instances will dart across the water at a high speed and take their victims to an unknown location. Discovering where SCP-5007 took their victims became a top priority for the Foundation. After extensive witness interviews and compiling a database of likely victims, they determined that there must be at least 16 instances of SCP-5007 unaccounted for. Personnel kept a close watch on the coastlines and waters of the Bass Strait and equipped various marine task forces with research vessels capable of tracking any instances if they encountered them. In 1985, the Foundation's research efforts paid off, and several survey teams operating in the area reported a sighting of an extremely large SCP-5007 instance heading towards a coastal town. A mobile task force was sent to track the entity. The team observed the entity from afar as it stalked a private fishing boat. Even from the distance, Foundation personnel recognized the likenesses of several missing persons as faces of the corpses of SCP-5007. The task force captain had to remind his team to keep it together, claiming that they were not people, but just parts of the specimen. But everyone secretly knew the truth. The fishing vessel was a private one, occupied by a small family. The entity slowly approached and quickly pulled a woman into the air. The family panicked and quickly tried to reach cover for safety, running into the ship's cabin. The entity ran its tentacles along the boat until it pulled the door open, snatching another two victims. The task force was unable to help them, as their mission was to track the instance to its origin point. It was a horror to watch. 
The task force implanted a tracking beacon onto the entity and quietly followed it out to sea over the next four hours. They then discovered a large gray reef with several shipwrecks dotted across it. 13 SCP-5007 instances floated over the area, some holding on to the land reef with their tentacles. The entity dropped the abductees from the fishing boat, who were coerced by the entities into diving into a massive pool of water located in the center of the reef. One by one, each abductee was pulled below the surface by something lurking in the pool, all while the SCP-5007 instances watched. Disgusted, the task force reported what they observed to the main site, and the reef would be designated as SCP-5007-A. The Foundation's analysis of the reef led to the discovery that the rock covering it seeped iron oxide from an unknown source, and the rocks achieved growth at an anomalously fast rate, often as little as 40 minutes. All of the wrecked ships and aircraft that washed across the shore of the reef were covered with a dark stone. The reef was teeming with anomalous marine life, including SCP-5007, a red algae that fed upon the freshly grown rock, marine worms capable of levitation, spiders that lived in silk retreats underneath the waterline, small fish, and giant organisms resembling large clumps of kelp, which the Foundation had previously documented as SCP-4159 in a separate investigation. SCP-5007 often rested their tentacles on the outcroppings of the reef while inactive, but what caught the Foundation's attention the most was the giant pit located in the reef's center. Unmanned exploration drones found that it had a depth of at least 4,000 meters, and water samples taken from the pit revealed large quantities of human DNA, prehistoric bacteria, and unknown compounds that possessed significant life-preserving qualities. When a being was submerged in the compound, they were able to survive heavy injuries, even when fully surrounded by the liquid and unable to breathe. The Foundation's exploration of one of these shipwrecks led them to a journal. Most of it was illegible due to water damage, but one passage survived, located in the back of the book. It detailed the experience of an unknown crew member of the ship caught in a storm. It reads, Morsby spied land ahead, and the boys said that there are giant balloons hanging over the island. We are all afeard, but there is naught we can do but beach ourselves and help for rescue. Should I be killed in the crash, I want my mates to give this journal to my Mary. Might know I spent my last thinking only of her. The interior of the ship contained human remains inside, but there were less skeletons than the Foundation would expect for a ship of its size. The location of the rest of the bodies was unknown. Another event related to SCP-5007 the Foundation documented involved Frederick Valentik, a pilot engaged in a training flight over the Bass Strait in 1978. Valentik's disappearance was marked by his latest communication with air traffic control, when he mistook an SCP-5007 instance for an unidentified aircraft. It seems like it's stationary. What I'm doing right now is orbiting, and the thing is just orbiting on top of me. Also, it's got a green light and sort of metallic, like it's all shiny on the outside. Shortly after this, Valentik's transmission was interrupted by what was described as metallic scraping sounds, believed to be the SCP-5007 instance attacking the aircraft and jamming its propellers with its mass. After crashing into the reef, it was believed that Valentik and his aircraft were pulled beneath the surface of the pit, just as the abductees had been prior. The Foundation decided to construct a provisional secure research facility on the reef. They named it Site-40-R and documented all returns and departures of SCP-5007. They also set up a series of containment procedures that resulted in SCP-5007 returning with its victims 83% less often than before the site's construction, but this was short-lived. In 2008, the site logged over 36 instances returning to the reef, with only two not having any fresh abductees. The instances' origins were unknown, and it was as if they appeared out of thin air. No other monitoring post had documented their appearance, or even spotted them before they arrived at the reef. It was years later in 2017 that the Foundation eventually was able to successfully explore what was deep inside the pit at the center of the reef. They already knew that there was a large entity lurking beneath, as evidenced by what happened to the victims of SCP-5007 that were later deposited inside the pool. All previous attempts to explore the pool were met with failure, as the water pressure of the pit's depths caused all craft to collapse due to hull damage. This time, however, they managed to construct a high-tech submarine, labeled the SCPS Nautilus, which was capable of diving a maximum of 13,500 meters underwater. 
they decided that a D-Class personnel would be trained to man the submersible and carry out the exploration. The mission was simple. The Nautilus was to dive to the bottom of the pit and to describe the depth readings. Cameras and microphones were equipped to the vessel. Due to the depth, remote viewing of the footage was impossible. Instead, the Foundation had to physically recollect the vessel in order to view the footage. Upon recovery, some of the footage suffered data corruption, but what was there shook those who viewed it to their core. The footage showed the D-Class's experience going deeper inside the pit. At first, it seemed ordinary. The trench had a number of rocky outcroppings dotted with black-yellow vines growing along the walls. Also present were various marine life forms, such as the spiders or the fish. Going deeper, the sub observed an SCP-5007 instance clinging to an outcropping. Several tendrils emerging from the pit's depths were wrapped around the instance and holding onto the entity, as if it were feeding from it. Another 16 SCP-5007 instances were seen resting along the walls, each clinging to the outcropping. As the sub went deeper, the D-Class remarked that there were dozens of plane and shipwrecks, but also well over a hundred SCP-5007 entities. Most of them were held there by the Black Tendrils. The D-Class, as the sub went even deeper, began noticing human remains. No short amount of them, either. Deep into the pit, there was a large mass of human remains covering the entirety of the pit. Bodies crushed and drained of blood, but still possessing intact eyes. Each individual was still alive, kept preserved by the life-sustaining compounds found within the water. The body stared at the sub and moved, attempting to grab onto the vehicle. The D-Class swore they were trying to say something, mouthing words to the camera of the sub. As the sub passed through the mass of bodies, it emerged into a completely dark, black clearing at the bottom of the pit. For a second, the D-Class thought he was safe. But then, a large black tentacle rapidly emerged from below and grabbed onto the Nautilus, dragging it even further into the depths. The D-Class screamed and panicked, but there was nothing he could do. The tentacle possessed a large cluster of eyes, mouths, and human heads seemingly grafted onto its mass. And then there was another tentacle, and then another. The Nautilus was pulled to the bottom of the pool. The D-Class's screams were still heard even as the picture cut out. Sometimes graphic body-altering images of the tentacle's features were visible on the screen, but most of the footage was indecipherable. After minutes of distorted, corrupted footage, the Nautilus was seen again, rapidly ascending to the surface. Somehow, it had managed to escape the entity at the bottom of the pit. Upon recovery of the craft, it was found that the Nautilus was covered in a thick, organic coating similar to a black slime mold, but with dozens of eyes growing from it. The D-Class inside showed severe psychological damage and attempted to harm Foundation personnel. They were terminated shortly after due to being a danger to those around them. Following review of the footage, the Nautilus was to be dismantled and incinerated, along with the remains of the D-Class. A reinforced containment seal was fitted over the pit, with the intention of keeping whatever was down there isolated from the surface. But this was short-lived. After the containment seal was fitted, Site-40 underwent a massive communications blackout. Every device on site received an email containing a single image of a large eye taken from a security camera. The text beneath it simply read, Found you. Some personnel who viewed the email underwent anomalous changes, growing new physical features such as eyes and other various growths across their body. The entirety of Site-40-R went offline, and the Foundation could not establish contact. In an emergency effort to do so, Mobile Task Force Gamma-6 Deep Feeders was sent to investigate. The task force's assault on Site-40-R was a daring effort, as the majority of the site was completely overtaken by tentacles, growths, and anomalous alterations. While numerous altered personnel were lost due to the mission, it was ultimately a success. Some altered personnel were able to be saved through extensive surgery to remove their anomalous growths. And after everything was said and done, the site was repaired and reconstructed without incident. Following the site's repair, there has been little activity from the entity within the pit, but the Foundation continued to keep an eye on the creature and the ecosystem of the anomalous marine life that live on the Bass Strait, never knowing what their next move might be, and always keeping in mind the risk that comes with dealing with these poorly understood entities. A lot of us have fond memories of Halloween. Dressing up in spooky costumes, wandering around the neighborhood with friends while trick-or-treating, getting home with literal buckets full of candy, and then eating so many sugary treats that you feel sick. 
Halloween is a beloved holiday, especially throughout many parts of the United States. And if you were lucky enough to grow up in a town that really went all out when the last night of October rolled around, then you may have even had a local Halloween-themed fairground to visit on the creepiest night of the year. Scary rides, mazes, and jack-o'-lanterns as far as the eye can see. But with all that said, if you lived in a certain town in the Midwest, then maybe the county fair is a little more frightening than the spirit of the Halloween season usually encourages. Settle in for a story of scares, a tale of terror, and a fable of frights. This is SCP-097, also known as Old Fairgrounds. Cordoned off by the SCP Foundation using huge concrete walls is 10 acres of rural land in an undisclosed area of the Midwestern United States. The place itself is completely abandoned, left silent and alone as everything contained within those walls slowly falls into disrepair. This is all that remains of the local county fair held in the year 1969. And right in the middle of it all, a pickup truck, crushed and wrecked beyond all use. But this truck didn't crash. Oh no, this was no tragic roadside accident. The thing that crushed it happened to be a gigantic pumpkin. Now, we aren't just talking about a local vegetable growing competition winner here. When we say this is a big pumpkin, we are talking huge. The colossal squash has been recorded to measure well over 7 meters in height, with a diameter just over 8 meters at the widest point. According to estimates, this pumpkin, known as SCP-097-1, weighs an enormous 15,000 kilograms, or 33,070 pounds. To give you a frame of reference, that's about four times the average weight of a hippopotamus. The pumpkin even manages to keep a perfectly spherical shape, staying plump and round rather than spreading out under its own weight as you might expect a plant of such size would. Okay, a pickup truck crushed by a giant pumpkin? You might be wondering, surely that can't be all there is. Well, don't you worry. We're just getting started with this creep show. The rest of the surrounding area of SCP-097 is abundant in overgrown pumpkins, none that quite reach the enviable size of SCP-097-1, but plenty of all different subspecies and types. On average, these smaller pumpkins weigh around 250 kilograms, or 550 pounds, Along with various other crops that have grown within the area of SCP-097, the pumpkins seem to have formed some kind of maze. No pun intended. Get it? Maze? Like corn? <laughs> These jokes are wasted on you. Spooky mazes are no strange inclusion at rural Halloween fairs like this one. Getting lost in the middle of the night surrounded by rows of corn taller than a human being is all part of the fun makes a person feel like they're right in the middle of a classic 80s slasher movie, where the killer could be creeping up behind them any second. The naturally formed labyrinth found within SCP-097 has spread all throughout what is left of the 1969 county fairgrounds, with the walls of crops reaching over one and a half meters tall, depending on the year. So, is that all? A maze of crops with one giant pumpkin at its center? Oh, that's far from all there is to SCP-097. During the time between April and November of every year, a number of bizarre and anomalous phenomenon takes place within this abandoned county fairground, ranging from strange happenings that defy explanation to things that are downright dangerous. Since they first came into contact with SCP-097, the Foundation have lost eight agents to this phenomenon that occur within that area, with another 17 being severely maimed. While the exact time of these events seems to vary, the SCP Foundation keeps an extensive record of phenomena that occur within SCP-097. Now, sometimes these will be as harmless and annoying as the sound of drums playing throughout the day for almost 24 hours without stopping. Then there's the sightings of entities moving through the maze only to disappear after a few short seconds. Security footage the Foundation agents have gathered of these entities depict them as what can only be described as bedsheet ghosts, the kind you might see and immediately think of as a last-minute low-budget Halloween costume. On one particular occasion, singing was heard in the maze, coming from an unidentified source. When analyzed, recordings made by the Foundation revealed that there were up to 30 children's voices, 
all singing in unintelligible gibberish for three consecutive hours. Another incident involved a member of personnel on site, Agent McRoy, who cut a pumpkin vine using a machete. Horrifyingly, the severed vine bled. By that we mean, actual human blood came pouring out of the plant. Another agent, on a separate occasion, was also found dead within the SCP-097 maze. Agent Long had disappeared on the way to the restroom, only to be discovered lifeless and bloodied resting against a pumpkin. During one weekly examination of SCP-097, one Agent Cole broke open a pumpkin completely by accident. As the pumpkin split apart, however, to the agent's horror, a child's skeleton was revealed to be inside. A human child skeleton. A little girl crouched in the fetal position believed to only have been about five years of age. Another incident saw O'Toole, a research assistant working on site at SCP-097, experiencing symptoms of nausea. O'Toole also appeared to be vomiting pumpkin seeds, despite not having eaten any recently. Within a day, O'Toole was dead, seeming to have died overnight in his sleep. An autopsy conducted by Foundation experts revealed that O'Toole's chest cavity, the space beneath his ribs, was somehow filled with the same pumpkin seeds. All of these happenings are strange, to say the least, but perhaps most concerning of all is the effect that the abandoned fairground of SCP-097 seems to have on children. Any under or up to the age of 10 years old can fall victim to an unpredictable signal that seems to emanate from SCP-097, with a maximum range that is, as of yet, undetermined. Usually beginning in early April, children that are affected by this signal become afflicted with somnambulism, or sleepwalking, as it is more commonly known. On clear nights, these children will wander around their own homes, often only stopping in front of closed doorways. This behavior usually doesn't happen often, at least at first, only occurring once a week. However, sleepwalking gradually becomes more frequent, and by around the middle of August, it will be a nightly occurrence. If children with this affliction are ever woken up while sleepwalking, they will scream for several seconds before appearing confused. This seems to be the only known way to break the influence of SCP-097. However, if left undisturbed, a child will spend their sleepwalking episodes familiarizing themselves with the doorways of their house. They will stop at every entrance, exit, garage door, gate, even the neighbor's front doors once they find a way outside. From September, the sleepwalking children will stay outside, upright but asleep until the sun comes up. Many are often found laying on the grass in their gardens, and commonly recall having dreams about autumn season activities. Between September 1st and November 1st, any affected child not awoken during their sleepwalking will begin to migrate towards SCP-097's location. All while still unconscious, they will traverse county roads, cutting across large empty fields, as they gradually make their way towards the abandoned remains of the county fairground. Once there, they will even be able to blindly navigate a path through the maze that surrounds most of SCP-097 until they find the center. What happens when they make it to the center of the maze? Any sleepwalking children who are able to make it that far will seek out SCP-097-1, the gigantic pumpkin crushing the truck in the middle of the SCP-097 area. The children will then sit down around the almost 23-foot-tall pumpkin and begin to sing. Even though the SCP Foundation have managed to make recordings of this, much of the singing seems to be gibberish, or at least, not sung in any known language. However, music will also begin playing from an unknown source, seeming to include a number of basic instruments, most commonly simple drums and pipes. After the sleepwalking children have spent a number of minutes singing like this, that is when things take a turn for the far, far worse like a Charlie Brown Halloween special straight out of your most horrific nightmares. From the tangled mess of plants that make up the maze within SCP-097, things will start to emerge. These entities will crawl out of the surrounding flora, or will come bursting out from within the larger of the nearby pumpkins. They appear to be childlike in both their appearance and mannerisms, some even wearing pajamas or similar clothing. Why? Simple because these are the children that sleepwalked before. They are all previous victims, the ones stolen from their families and brought into this maze. Still wearing the clothes that they were last seen in, 
They are all the children known to be lost to SCP-097. What happens next is truly chilling. The latest child that has been affected by the draw of the pumpkin-filled fairground will be quickly surrounded by all their fellow victims. The other children, if they are in fact still human children, will encircle the newest child, singing and dancing around them in a circle. As they do this, a dim light begins to glow from somewhere within SCP-097-1, the biggest pumpkin in the center of SCP-097. Finally at this point in the process, the newly affected child will wake up. Normally they experience a great deal of terror and confusion. After all, they have been unconscious throughout this entire ordeal, sleepwalking far away from the safety of their own home to a maze in the middle of nowhere. Terror is a powerful thing, enough to make even the bravest person let out a scream. But the moment the now-awakened child lets out any sound, that is when they are doomed. Should they scream, cry, or make any form of vocal noise, then the others will swarm them. The other children, the ones previously lured into SCP-097 while sleepwalking, will attack the terrified newcomer. Each time is different. Sometimes they will claw at the new child. Other times they might bite or kick. The methods are always different. But most often this swarm of the pumpkin's previous victims will strangle or dismember the latest visitor to the abandoned fairground. At this point, there is no saving the latest victim. Any attempt to interfere will only fail. Either the children will all become intangible, or another violent phenomenon will occur within SCP-097, stopping any onlooker from saving the child's life. When the deed is finally done, and the latest victim has been killed by the other children, the gigantic pumpkin at the heart of SCP-097 will open, its side will split like a pair of great, devouring jaws, and the children will throw the body of the newest child into SCP-097-1. Once the body has been disposed of, these entities, once children that sleepwalked away from their families, will follow, crawling into the pumpkin before it closes and the music finally stops. The exact number of children between the ages of 3 and 10 years of age who have been lost to SCP-097 is currently kept secret by the Foundation. And perhaps for all of our sanities, that is for the best. Like we said, a lot of us have fond memories of Halloween, but not all of us. Now go check out SCP-823 Carnival of Horrors and SCP Herman Fuller's Circus of the Disquieting for more creepy carnivals and unsettling circuses.